supplied, there was only three breweries in Vancouver at that time. And his was called the Mainland Brewery. And there was another one called Doring and Marsden. And another one called the Red Cross Brewery. And uh, then they were talking, the CPR was talking to uh, Van Horn, you know, trying uh, to uh, get the crow's nest line from uh, Lethbridge, Alberta, to uh, uh, to Nelson, and uh, they had, the CPR had already had built a piece from uh, Nelson to uh, uh, Sproats Landing, you know, East Robson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Columbia and Kootenai. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh, so this uncle, then the slow can discovery was made in 1891. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this uncle, he decided that he would like to, he was going to go to Caswell, because Caswell was the big place, see. And he, uh, he left my father uh, with the brewery in, uh, down on the... Uh, Falls Creek. Falls Creek, yes. And uh, uh, he came up, he went by a great northern train from Vancouver to Spokane, and then Spokane up to uh, uh, Bonner's Ferry, and he took the boat from Bonner's Ferry around Pilot Bay and up to Caslow. Mm -hmm. And he looked Caslow over, and because uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was about 7,000 people in Caslow then. And he looked it over, and uh, then he had heard of Nelson and that, and he thought, well, I'm going to go down and have a look at Nelson. So he uh, he came down to Nelson, and uh, this was in March 1893. And he went up the hill, like I was telling you before, there was nothing about Baker Street, and only stumps and boulders and stuff, you know. And... Uh, he got up to the site of uh, the, where the Trafalgar School is now, and he discovered a spring. Mm -hmm. And he uh, found out that this water was uh, just uh, perfect for making beer, for brewing beer. And he sized up the situation. He's a pretty shrewd businessman. He, uh, they were just breeding the Great Northern track into Nelson mm -hmm. and he thought well now all his supplies would come from Washington mm -hmm. so he thought well now by uh, building on Latimer Street he would have a downhill pole with all his freight and materials that he would use for brewing mm -hmm. and uh, then he'd go up to there empty with this Team horses. Pull up to the mountain station empty. Yeah, empty, and, and, and but he come down, down, full. down. Right. Well, then his beer and stuff had to go all downtown, see? Yeah. And then the empty cakes go back up the hill, so he had it worked out good. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, he. Did that land at that time belong to Newland Hoover, Hoover? Or was it unclaimed land? I always thought that everything. North of, like in that whole section of the city, belonged to Newland Hoover in the early days. Well, I, I don't know. Where, it yeah, it could, it who he bought this it from. Hoover had the point over there where Burns said. Uh, yeah, he moved Burns over had, there after. That was right. Hoover's point. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, Hoover, yeah. and he had an explosives business or something over there. I, I never did know yeah. what he had. Okay, well let's go back. So, so he he picked the spot. He had yeah. the perfect water. Yeah. How did he know yeah. he had the perfect water? But you got it analyzed, uh -huh. and uh, what do you look I don't for know in the water? They, maybe they had kits themselves yeah. for testing. I don't know. What do you look for? In water. Pardon? What do you look for in water? Well, it had to be pure water, and I guess with uh, uh, nothing uh, that uh, uh, could make contaminate it or anything. You know, it yeah. had to be really pure, and of course, a spring would be. Mm -hmm. So he uh, then he sent for my father. And he told him, he says, now, he said, you come up to Nelson, and this is where we're going to go. Well, my father come up to Revelstoke. Did they sell the brewery in Vancouver before it uh, came, or did they hold on to it? No, they left it, and uh, they left it there, and 
he told my father to come up to Nelson. So he got my father came up and he got to Revelstoke. Mm -hmm. And he was there for 10 days because uh, and the arrow lakes was still frozen, frozen over, see? So he come down here. Well, then they worked that summer and they put up all the buildings, see? And uh, then when the snow come late in the fall, I don't know whether it be in December, they went back uh, to Vancouver and uh, the uncle had his wife and two children there then, two boys. So they dismantled all of the equipment, uh, equipment and shipped it up to Nelson. And then they come up in the, uh, as soon as the snow was gone, and they installed the stuff. And that was, would be the year 19, 1894 then. So, so they, they got their first beer out in 1895. And they had the first brewery of all breweries around here then. And uh, what did they call it? They called it the Reesterer Brewery then. Well then uh, they had no refrigeration and they used to go down to the mouth of Cotton Creek on the lake mm -hmm. and they used to cut the ice. ice and my father said that they had um, they had it four feet high, solid ice and upstairs see uh, top floor of the brewery, and uh, they had a full of sawdust and that mm -hmm. to uh, help insulate it, and that had to keep their cellars mm -hmm. uh, cool, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I, and in 1890, February 1897, uh, uh, my father's aunt had a baby daughter, and she died with childbirth, see, and uh, I don't know whether it was just after that, they went down to cut the ice. And this uh, ant was buried in the cemetery and all that's in the tourist park yeah. now. But then it was moved up the hill yeah. there. Yeah. Um, then uh, he took in a partner. But the, before that, uh, like after the ant died, they went down to cut the ice and we got a Chinook. And it ruined all the ice. Wow. So he took in a partner, a man by the name of Mr. George Rowley. And this man uh, was just out from England. And uh, he uh, he became the manager of the brewery. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the uncle, my father's uncle, who was the brewer, mm -hmm. and uh, the man, uh, the superintendent of mm -hmm. the brewery, see, but they're equal partners. Mm -hmm. And my father said that this man, George Rowley, was the finest man that he ever knew. He says he was a real good man, and he died in the hospital here, I think, about 1917, and my father the new, was the new hospital down there mm -hmm. then. And my father used to go to see him because he never knew a man that he liked as much as oh. this man. And uh, so, then, uh, <coughs> uh, okay, can I just backtrack a little bit? Yeah. Where did they get their malt and their hops and all, from all Washington, that? From Washington. Uh, I guess it would be uh, uh, from Spokane, the supply house, mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. But where it came, but it was American grown. Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of beer did they make? A Pilsner type or no, a different type? Lager. Lager type. And I asked my father years after. I said, uh, Pop, I said, what uh, What do you mean by lager? He said, that means brew that is aged. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think that was supposed to be uh, three months old, to be perfect, mm -hmm. to be uh, matured. Like. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I remember we were out in the boat, oh, this was in the 1940s, uh, after I'd come out of the army, uh, Roy Sharp used to go fishing uh, with me a lot. And my father, sometimes he'd come and they would be talking about early days. And uh, Roy uh, was asking them about the brewery. And my father said, you know, he said, uh, then when they were building the crow's nest, see, and opening up the slow can and the railroads like from the castle to uh, three parts of Sandin and the from uh, Nakas uh, to three parts in Sandin yeah. too. Um, 
He said that they brew three times a day, and, and he said the beer never got to be three weeks old. He says they were after it. <laughs> he said, and, and uh, this went on, and uh, how did they bottle it? How big? Well, it was then that when they first. Right. Uh, yeah, and then they had pints too, mm -hmm. and uh, but at first it was all cake beer, ah, wrapped okay. beer, see, to the yeah. hotel yeah. and saloons, and they had little cakes that they called pony cakes. Uh -huh. uh, they were an, uh, uh, an eighth of a barrel, uh -huh. and a barrel, my father said, was two, uh, you know, these aluminum cakes they have now, yeah. they're the same as the old cakes used to be. Okay. Two of those made a barrel. One of those is a half barrel. Right. Okay. And then they had quarter cakes, see? And then they had the little for picnics and stuff, yeah. you know, or people's uh, for homes, right. uh, where uh, they called them pony cakes. And I remember seeing some little, little ones with the reached her name on them that from the early days, you know, but they're, they're all gone now. Yeah. Where did they get the cake made? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, they probably got them for Sweeney's. Yeah, that's uh, After. Yeah. But uh, how my father came out from Milwaukee uh, as a 15 year old boy in 1890, he came out with his father from Milwaukee. His father was uh, the brother of this uncle. Uh, he was a cooper. They made cakes mm -hmm. and they made bats and all of this. And uh, they, uh, the uncle needed some more equipment, and uh, he got my father's uncle uh, to come out from Milwaukee. And uh, my father was, uh, I think, the second oldest of 11 kids. And uh, uh, the old man was out here and finished his work, and, uh, and he was homesick for his family, naturally. Mm -hmm. And he went back. And my father wouldn't go back. He was a kid raised in Milwaukee, and the only place he had to play on was on the streets yeah. in a big city, you know. Yeah. And when he saw the West, you know, and he had never seen trees or anything, and boy, he, uh, there was no way for the, I guess he was a spoiled brat yeah. too, maybe. So he stayed with his uncle? Yeah. Huh? So he stayed out here with his uncle? Yeah. Uh -huh. And he stayed out till 1898, and he never saw his father after he left him. Uh, 1893, when he went back to Milwaukee, because his uh, father died a year or two after that. He had been caught in the war, the Franco-Prussian War, and uh, spoke or something. I think he was only 49, and my father never saw him. But then in 1898, my father went back to Milwaukee, and uh, he was going to stay. First, he thought he was going to stay for good. Mm -hmm. Well, then he decided that uh, he was there three weeks and he had had enough of that. He wanted to get back here. And, uh, and his mother kept after him. He stayed three months and then he brought his sister and uh, a brother out here. And uh, then he. Uh, so he was That's when he decided to build his own brewery on Paul Mines Road. Okay, I just meant, okay. The Reister Brewery was on Latimer Street. No, That's right. On the Latimer Street, yeah, where the site, 500 block right on the site. Where the brewery was. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's, okay. yeah, that's the site of that old brewery. Okay, and that, what was that uncle's name? We better get his name. He's Robert right. Alfonso. Robert Alphonse. Alphonse or Alphonse, yeah. Okay. He's buried up in the cemetery. He's in the cemetery yeah. up here. So that's the one who ran the Reister Brewery up yes. on Latimer Street. Yeah. Okay, now, your father started his own brewery. Yeah. Okay, let's, okay, what yeah. was his name? His, uh, Julius Robert. Julius Robert, okay. Yeah. And what year? Then he built that in 1899. Okay, in 1899 he built a brewery. Okay, yeah. where now? Uh, but that was on Hall Mines Road. I tell you who lives in that, uh, on that site. Some of the timber and stuff, lumber in that house is that Agnews, you know, that lived uh, oh, right yeah. across from the convent. Right. Yeah. Right. Blackwood's old home. Right. Okay. And that was the site where the Imperial Brewery, my father called his. Uh huh. 
And, okay, now, I, I just want to ask, meanwhile, has Bury built up in all the other places, like in Caslow and, and in Yeah, Sandin well, and there was and, there's one on, uh, on um, Chatham Street was built in 1897 by old Bill Gosnell. Okay. And when my father's uncle died, uh, they sold the estate and there was uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, John Blumberg that uh, had the new Grand Hotel. Mm -hmm. He and Malone and Tregillis and uh, uh, Wally Thompson, who had the, uh, he used to be the uh, uh, head of all the uh, bar rooms on the boats, inland boats, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. You've heard of him, yeah. Wally Thompson. And then he had a, a wholesale liquor place and a saloon called the Office Saloon, or just about where um, uh, Poulin's place is now, in the old Aberdeen block. No, Griffin Block. Griffin. No, yeah. no, no. Yeah, Griffin. That's Griffin. It burned. That's Walter Wade Corner. Yeah. That's okay. the Griffin Block. Not the Broken Hill Block? Well, uh, I never heard it called. The, uh, I remember the name was up on there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Griffin Block. Okay. Um, okay. Um, they, okay, now, what did they do, all those men Three. together? Three berries? Oh, yeah. no, those... They bought out, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Mr. Um, they bought out the estate. Of yeah, the Mr. Estate, uh, and I think that's uh, when uh, uh, Mr. Um, I told you his name from Harry uh, that they, uh, when they formed it, the Nelson Bury, uh, uh, George, George. He, just, he had a, a son, I think, or a nephew that was on the Herrick Ferry for years. Uh, George, George. You can Huh? Rowley. Rowley? that's oh, it. Okay. Yeah, George Rowley, okay. yeah. Okay, now. No, they bought out. The, they bought your uncle's yeah, estate. estate yeah. Okay, and what, and meanwhile, this this other brewery down on, on yeah, Chatham Street. Well, Chatham, Chatham Street. My father was brewing for Gosnell in that brewery after uh, he lost, my father lost his brewery. Uh, he had to make an assignment in uh, 1901 when the big uh, strike of the Rossland Mines mm -hmm. and the Silver King and the Hall Mine Smelter and all of those went on strike and for nearly a year. For the eight hour day, was that the, the That's rest? it, yeah, yeah, for the eight hour day. Yeah. And, uh, they, oh, they had an awful time there, and uh, they got the eight-hour day, and they got better working conditions. But my father was one of the victims, and he wasn't the only one. He mm -hmm. lost his brewery, so then he went to work for Gosnell mm -hmm. in and the what Castle was it? Yeah, was it Castle Brewery? Yes. Okay, your father's was the Imperial Brewery. Yes. It lasted from 1899 to 1901? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, he lost it, and no one else operated it after no, him. No, I think uh, I think uh, W. R. McLean, that was the manager of Thorpe's Bottling Works, that was on the site yeah. where Kirby Grenfell lives now. Yeah. On. Yeah. And my father worked there for a little while. For uh, but McLean, I don't know if he had somebody else. They had to run the brewery for a little bit, and I think my father worked uh, a month or two or something like that for him. Mm -hmm. And then he went to work for Gosnell down in the Castle Brewery. Okay. okay. And when they bought that estate, they closed the Castle Brewery. Gosnell was they the bought, manager. They bought Gosnell out uh, as well? Or he joined no, well, in with this partnership? Didn't they, didn't they put Gosnell on there? As no, well? no. He yeah. was one of them, eh? Yeah. Okay. He okay. was the man. He went up as manager. He was the biggest. Uh, I see. I think he had the most money in there. I see. So they closed the one down in Chatham. Yeah. And where the big Lombardy popper used to be, what? the big popper tree used to be. Yeah. Okay, and that closed completely yeah. out of the brewery? it never worked again. Okay, and then they moved everything, all operations moved to uh, Latimer uh, Street. Uh, yeah, Gosnell, 
uh, law went up as manager, uh -huh. and my father went up as the brewer. Uh -huh. And then my father brewed there uh, till uh, uh, 1900, and I guess it must be 1904 mm -hmm. when uh, he uh, when he went to Grand Forks. Okay, I'm just gonna, okay. What was that brewery called? Which uh, the the amalgamation of. It was, uh, it was called the Nelson Brewery, just the same as it had been uh, when my father took in his partner, George Rowley. That, that was the big, it was London Rooster, it was yeah. uh, Nelson Brewery. Thing. That's right, yes. Okay. okay, I think we got that straight. Okay, 1904, now your father goes to Grand Forks. Yes. And he married? He married, uh, uh, he met my mother when she came to Nelson in 1902. And where did she come from and why was she going uh, to Nelson? She originally came out from Norway. She was a Norwegian. Oh, really? And uh, she, uh, her uncle, who had been uh, in the Klondike Gold Rush, and he had gone back, at, he had uh, gone back to uh, Norway. Norway. And then in 1900, he decided the first of April they came out to the United States and he brought her mm -hmm. to Minneapolis because it's Scandinavian yeah, all there. Yeah. My mother started to learn English there and the uncle went on up back to the Klondike. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and another guy, I guess, made it very good and he went back then to Norway and he was there. Long after my mother died, uh, my mother went uh, back to Norway uh, with my sister Anne that died uh, in 1938. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were back there just when the big war scare, and they were all, uh, the Germans were all in around Norway, see. Mm -hmm. The war hadn't broken out till 39, see, but, uh, and my mother was, Kind of outspoken, and and Nanny and kicked her in her foot, and she said, "Now, mom, you keep your mouth shut, or you know we'll all be in jail." Yeah, and, really. And uh, so they got back uh, out uh, here. Uh, they got back in I forget October or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but Kay and and her family, they, they were. They went over there and they had to get back. I think they were on the boat when when the, when the Second World War broke out. It was the first ship out after the Pardon? Yeah, we came back on the Duchess of York, which was the first ship to leave England yeah. after the Athenian was bombed. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Then. Okay, let's go back to we'll go back to family. Yeah. Where, okay, so your mom was living in Minneapolis and yes. she was learning English. Yeah. How did she come to Nelson? What what brought her? Uh, here? Well, I don't know whether she knew somebody here, uh -huh. but she came out here, uh, and I remember her saying she came out on the Great Northern right. trains. Yeah, I guess she must have taken the Chicago Milwaukee. Yeah. And uh, the St. Paul train, you know, the, isn't that the flyer? Or was that the flyer? Mm, uh, not sure. Yeah. Well, anyway, that doesn't matter. And she. Uh, and then Nelson and Sh Fort Shepherd up to here. Okay. Yeah. And uh, then uh, the first place she went to work, I think, was the Kootenai Steam Laundry, the one uh, that was where Two Door are now. Mm -hmm. The Larson family had it, and uh, then she left that, and uh, she went to work at the Silver King Hotel. And, Up and on that, the mountain? Pardon? No, oh, no, oh. it was down on Baker Street, you okay. know, Tommy George houses and mm -hmm. all of that, and like where, uh, what's in there now, it used to be... Uh, uh, Sweet Sixteen or something. Yeah, the band of camera. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, r right from the KWC block, that way was the Silver King Hotel, oh, okay. and she went uh, away tables there, and uh, that I think that's when my father met her, mm -hmm. and so they were married in 1903, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, uh, in 1904. They went to uh, 
Grand Forks. And uh, did you brewery. start a brewery there, or go to no, work no. for something? No, no. There was two breweries there, and there, this one was. I think the man whose name was Graham, that they called it the North Fork Brewery, mm -hmm. which up behind the the Grand Smuggler up the North Fork of the Cattle River. River. Right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, he, uh, I don't know just how long he was there, but uh, that's where I was born. Mm -hmm. And like I was saying, that uh, uh, that's the reason that my mother and them went. It took uh, two days to go there and two days to come back. Right. Let's just let's tell that getting from from right. Nelson to Grand Forks. Describe that for yeah. me on the table. Well, uh, they had to take the the Great Northern steam train, you know, uh, from the mountain station uh, to Spokane, and that used to be about a 12-hour trip, and then they had to stay over at night, they took another branch line to Danville, Washington, and uh, then a horse drawn stage coach from Granville Humpty Bump uh, mm -hmm. on the way to Grand Forks, and I don't know, I think he said it's about 20 miles, I could be wrong mm -hmm. with that. So, uh, and then I, all the way to Grandy, yeah, yeah. to the smelter. That's another. Well, uh, no, the Grand Forks smelter was right in Grand Forks, you know, just up on the edge of the town. And uh, the, the big mountainous lag is still there yet. Yeah. My father said that one at night that used to look like the Fourth of July. The whole sky lit up when they dumped the hot mm -hmm. slag. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was. <clears throat> When I was three weeks old, my mother took typhoid fever, and uh, my father said that it was nip and tuck. He didn't figure that either one of us would live. And uh, finally, uh, he quit the, uh, the brewery then, gave them notice, and he went to work uh, at the Grand Reef Smelter. And the bosses of the Grand Reef Smelter used to be the bosses of the Hall Mine Smelter here, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Paul Johnson and... Uh, uh, man by the name of Scully and uh, different names I've forgotten them now. They went to uh, Grand Forks and of course my father knew them and uh, he uh, went and got a job just till we were well enough to travel back. So I, I figured I'm a pioneer. I rode that uh, uh, stagecoach mm -hmm. mm -hmm. old-fashioned stagecoach. But uh, oh, I have to tell you you were talking about, uh, asked me about uh, where they supplied the beer and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But my father said that there were 29 outlets in Nelson. That would be the saloons, the you know, bar room saloons. Uh, there was, uh, I forget where they said there was three wholesale liquor. And there were clubs like the Nelson Club. Yeah, there was a Nelson Club. And, uh, the, and that, there was all of them. Um, how about the Rocky Mountain Rangers place, the, the armory? Did they have a pop at the... Oh, I don't know whether they yeah. had one. Uh, they, uh, uh, the old uh, drill hall, mm -hmm. uh, between the First and Second World War, that's where the uh, uh, Canadian Legion was, you know, mm -hmm. the Bethlehem, they called it. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, they, How about, did they supply the boats too? Oh yes, and they and they supplied the liquor store, and they supplied all that big Lake Street too. And uh, mm -hmm. I was told that there was a hundred and fifty girls on Lake Street. Yeah, there was two oh two blocks of them. Yeah. And earlier than that, they were on the end of Baker Street. You know, like where um, uh, that uh, big Graves had his shot mm -hmm. all the way along there on both sides. Yeah. And uh, I don't know further up even. And then they, in 1901, they had to move down to Lake Street. Well, it's I'm right all that. Boring, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you where the where the big uh, batch of beer used to be drunk. There was one of the hotels called the Club Hotel, and that was on the site where the Vivan Apartments are now. Right. And the, it was built right from Stanley Street, you know, uh, like where the wall is there. Uh, uh, on the Stanley Street side of the van apartments. Yeah. Well, the building went right out to there, see? And then it went all the way back across uh, the parking lot that the van mm -hmm. apartments have on the east side. And there was one very big room there 
than with what the length of the hotel, and I don't know how wide, wider than this house anyway. And my father said that they used to, when they were building the Crow's Nest line, and the line from uh, Nelson to Proctor, mm -hmm. uh, all the fellas working, the biggest part of them were Italians and Finns, you know. They would come in Saturday night, and they would go in to there, to the club hotel, and they had big long play tables and benches, mm -hmm. and they used to sit there and uh, eat peanuts and drink beer, and he, my father says that the peanut shells were that high on the floor Monday wow. morning. And Monday morning, when they went to pick up the cakes, there was 29 half barrels empties, and uh, that was one place. Then he told me about the big smelter picnics that they used to have, uh, the Hall Mine Smelter. And this Paul Johnson uh, made a deal with my father's uncle. They put up at the far side of the brewery. It was shady there, you know, and uh, it was alongside of the boiler room and that. Uh, they uh, put up great big long tables like they had in the strat or in the club hotel and benches. And he said, my father said they packed the beer out as fast as they could pack it in water buckets, you know, like they used to uh, have for the horses to drink out of. And uh, they had the great big stacks and stacks of cheese and dill pickles and ham sandwiches and uh, all of this stuff and uh, uh, red herring and stuff, you know, little smoked mm -hmm. herring, all of this stuff. And this was the smells for picnic and those They had it right at the brewery. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and then uh, oh, the outside, yeah, up, <laughs> uh, outside on the side of the brewery. Oh, and uh, and 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 uh, he said that boy, he says, could those fellas drink beer? And uh, the smelter had two of these picnics. Uh, one was for the day shift, mm -hmm. and then two weeks later, they'd have another one. What, whatever day uh, was the uh, weather friend right. permitting, uh -huh. they uh, they had the night, night shift one. Yeah. Then that was one thing. Then there was uh, uh, another thing. Uh, my father showed me the um, trail down from you know where the slag pile is, old yeah. slag pile used to be. Yeah, it coming down be, to the yeah. back of here. Yeah, there was a. The railroad tracks used to come up uh, up from the sheep yard, up and uh, when you went out to Granite Road, you drove underneath the bridge there. Mm -hmm. Of course, you wouldn't remember that. No, but I've seen pictures. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, he showed me the trail, and mind you, this was 50 years after, or close to 40 years anyway, I guess. Uh, he says, that's where they used to go uh, at night, the guys, they had these granite dinner pails, you know, mm -hmm. they would hold about three quarts, and uh, uh, they were about that deep, see, about that round, and the top, uh, uh, they had the sandwiches and everything in, see, and the bottom would be for tea or coffee, whatever they had, see, and they packed that to the mines, you know, all, all over the, the smelters and everywhere, they had those dinner pails, you know, in the city, they used to <laughs> drink their tea or coffee. <laughs> no, they'd send one of the guys down, down uh, from the um, no. smelter. They'd sneak down the back way, and they had a trail down through there. And they had a great big long stick like the Chinamen used to have, you know, with their baskets. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see those? Mm -hmm. And they had nails on them so that you put this one, the handle of that one, hanging on here along. And they would pack a dozen or more. Uh, these up, and they used to sneak down to the Sherbrooke Hotel. Where was that? Sherbrooke Hotel <coughs> was that, uh, it's, uh, did they call it the Victor Rooms now, below? Oh, yeah. yeah. Below um, the Savoy. No, below the Savoy, yes. Yeah, down yeah. down closer to the corner. The Victor That's, Apartments, I think. Yeah, <coughs> Gallagher's grocery store used to be right below it, if uh, you remember that. Well, the Sherbrooke Hotel was run by the Sturgeons and Mr. Uh -huh. Venue. Uh -huh. And they built it. They started with a tent there. And uh, they they used to sneak down there and, you know, they'd take some of the uh, butter from one of their sandwiches and smear it around the top of the pail so there'd be no foam, see? Right. 
It'll be beer right up in that lid down <laughs> tight. <laughs> Sneak back to work yeah. and drink it on the job? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, those furnaces are... Yeah. Hot. Oh, boy. Well, let's yeah. talk cost. How right. much would that cost? Oh, then, that beer? Oh, I imagine that would have been about... Uh, maybe... Uh, Two bits or thirty-five cents or something. For that three-quart yeah, yeah. container. Yeah. Okay. And how much? Actually, that's even more expensive than it is now compared to your wages, isn't it? Oh yeah. You know what? Because the man was only making. Uh, and the smelter. Uh, if they made thirty cents an hour, yeah. they were lucky. Yeah. They, they they worked twelve hours in the smelter. Right. And in the mines, they worked 10 hours because they had to uh, uh, blast and they had to wait to mm -hmm. make sure that uh, that all the... Uh, Explosives were yeah, blown? Yeah, like uh, in a, a tunnel, there's generally uh, about 10 holes, like, you know, mm -hmm. that are drilled in and they're loaded with dynamite and each mm -hmm. one with a cap. Right. Well, uh, that's the, the miners when he likes those things. They all like them at the end of, uh, like, say, uh, they start at 7 in the morning and they quit at 3. Mm -hmm. Well, they, maybe they would start at 2 o'clock or something like that to, uh, Black for uh, tomorrow. to load the holes and last yeah. And then they'd have to stand, get way back, and, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe a couple of blocks or so. Because when one, one of those shots go off, the concussion in there, mm -hmm. you can feel yourself lifting. Because yeah. I know I was in there in the Yankee girl working. And uh, that, so they had to blow smoke, clear the air too, mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that there wasn't any, if there's, if, say there's 10 holes, and uh, there's uh, only, they only hear nine, nine shots, they have to mark down that there's one miss hole. That's what they call it, a miss hole. And, uh, and many a person lost their eyesight uh, by that drilling into a miss hole. Mm -hmm. And I know two of them. Oh, no. there was blind Jack McDonald was another McDonald. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah. Oh. He, he lost his eyesight in the jewel mine uh, at Greenwood. I think they call it Dentonia now. Okay, so... So it was about thirty cents an hour. So a yeah. man earned three dollars a day if he yeah. worked a ten-hour yeah. day, yeah. and he paid twenty-five cents for beer. So basically, well, that was there were twelve hours in the smelter, yeah. yeah. But I mean, yeah. so he actually it was even more expensive than it is now if a man oh, earned yeah, yeah sure. to buy beer. Yeah. Hmm, that's interesting. And uh, what percentage alcohol was the beer? I think those days, uh, I think it was twelve percent. Like well, I could be wrong now, but I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah, like well, it was wrong, yeah. 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 Did they use, okay, I better ask some things about the beer. Did they use sugar? Yes. They did use sugar. Yeah. Because somebody told me in Germany you couldn't use sugar in Oh, well, uh, that uh, that could be so because uh, the same thing, the beer today is not made like it was no, made no, then. I know. And uh, uh, they could use saccharin mm -hmm. to sweeten okay. them. They got malt. But they had malt and hops and, and sugar and yeah. water and yeah. yeast yeah. and, and yeah. did your father have, like a brewmaster had the responsibility for when the working was finished, right? And oh, when, yeah. And when to bottle well, he was, uh, Can he you was, tell us about he, how he, that beer was made? Pardon? Can you describe how they made the beer? Oh, no, I, you I, I never, that. you know, I once thought that I would like to, Learn. Learn. when I was a kid, I wanted to be a brewer too. And my father says, nothing to it. He says, one brewer, and the family's enough. And he says, if I had my life to do over, I wouldn't be a brewer. I'd be anything but. Mm -hmm. um, Why did he feel like that? He felt well, responsible? Uh, no, no. I think it's like, uh, uh, it's damp and wet and cold and hot. And standing over a brew kettle and steaming, and then you drink a uh, beer, you have to taste a certain amount, and then you get so that you drink it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he always used to put on weight, mm -hmm. and uh, and he used to love 
oatmeal porridge for breakfast, but he couldn't eat that or corn or any of those things when he was working in the brewery because he'd break out in hives. But he, and the minute that he was out of the brewery, a few weeks after, uh, he used to always have bacon and eggs and toast when he was in the brewery, but he couldn't uh, eat any of those things. And he never would take anything, um, desserts or anything. He didn't like that one. I think they had, there was so much sugar in the beer. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel sick. Yeah. You'd be around it all the time. Okay, so now we've got the Nelson Brewery up here. On, yeah. How many men were working there? Oh, uh, they Regular. used to, oh, uh, at first there used to be, uh, I doubt if there was a dozen. And when the war was on, uh, First World War and Prohibition come, there was, I guess, only about a half a dozen in the brewery. Now, this is something you want to know about uh, brewing. Uh, uh, when, when they uh, had the, they called it near beer, it was only 2% alcohol. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, they had to brew it the same way, but then the brewer had to know how to extract the alcohol. Mm -hmm. And my father, like, was uh, uh, born in Milwaukee. And it was called the Brewery. town of the world. Yeah. Well, in 1908, there was talk of uh, prohibition coming about uh, oh, nine right. years before it yeah. did, see? And so my father uh, took leave uh, absence from the brewery here. He had gone they back went, to the brewery he here went, when you moved back. He went to back to Milwaukee, and he took us back there. And there was a... a uh, there was uh, my father, my mother, and my sister Margaret, and uh, and my brother Bob, and me. We were five, mm -hmm. and we were back there six months or so. And he took this course in the place called the Hockey's Bruin School. <laughs> and uh, have you ever heard of the rifles at Vancouver, the George Rifle and oh, the Henry Rifle? Yeah. Well. When my father went back there, and uh, the old man rifle, Henry rifle, uh, came up to Nelson and asked my father he was going to send his son back, this George rifle. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, George rifle went back to Ma Milwaukee, mm -hmm. too, and my father was supposed to be a, kind of a chaperone, like, you know. And, uh, and then uh, they... My brother Jimmy has the, my father's diploma and his class picture mm -hmm. uh, of the hockey brewing school. Then there was Mr. Beener from uh, Phoenix. Mm -hmm. He came over to Nelson to interview my father in 1911 mm -hmm. to find out and about the hockey brewing school. And his son uh, was later a brewer here in Nelson, mm -hmm. Billy Beener. You probably remember that name. Not a familiar well, name, but I. And he he went there too, and they had. They what had were to, they learning there? Well, they had to see you brew the same way, but then you had to learn how to extract that extra alcohol out. And uh, see, and it, like the brewers always had to make out their reports, how many gallons they made each brew, and so on, and what type of beer and that for the government excise tax. Uh -huh. See. They had all of that and uh, to look after, and then they had to know temperatures, you know, uh, beer uh, can get contaminated so easy, mm -hmm. and it can get what they call wild, you know, when you open up a, mm -hmm. a bottle, it's all, all, yeah. uh, it's, uh, all foam, yeah. and that's uh, uh, all those things you have to know how to guard against, see, mm -hmm. it's a, a real uh, Professional, no, we'll yeah. and uh, but uh, and then you wanted to know about the other breweries too. Okay, well, so this is man. Okay, so your father went there in 1911. It took you uh, off. Uh, 1908. Eight. It yeah. took you off. Yeah. And then came back here. Yeah, I came back after went, six months. Or yeah, well, he was gone. I think about seven months mm -hmm. altogether, going and coming. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, 
and then he went back to the Nelson Brewery, uh -huh. and he was there, uh, I think one year, uh -huh. and then he went to Calgary, and he took us all there too, and it was, this brewery was called the Golden West Brewery, and it was right across the road on the prairie, like uh, the Red Road track went by, and the P. Burns big slaughterhouse uh -huh. where Calgary was there. That was another thing he had to worry about, you know, when get the beer contaminated. And he went up there in, uh, I think it was November, beginning of December. And then he had to find a place, and he found a place for us up there. And he sent, and we left Nelson, my mother, and uh, my brother Ernie then was the fourth child. He was the baby. And uh, uh, we left on Boxing Day. And that was a tough trip for my mother with the four babies, you know. And uh, I guess you went on the boat. And then yeah, we went on the. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, it'd be Kaskanuk then because yeah. the Nisukan wasn't available. Right. And, uh, uh, to uh, Kootenay Landing. Right, and then on the train. Uh, yeah, and then to McLeod. Oh, and then to Calgary, and it was on the outskirts of Calgary, you see. Why did he leave? What, just more money, a chance to be the boss? Yeah, or? and the brewer that uh, became manager up there, and he had been the brewer here when uh, my uh, father uh, went to Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And uh, he lived on Josephine Street. His name was Poplier. A German name. Well, when he become manager, he, he, he wrote and asked my dad to go there. <laughs> my father was a top-notch brewer, not because I say so, no. but he was a, actually a top-notch brewer. And how long did he stay in Calgary? Well, when the spring come with the slaughterhouse over there, the great big blowfly started flying. My father says goodbye, <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't want no more typhoid fever. Right. So we come back to Nelson. And, uh, and you were about six or seven? Uh, Nineteen nine. I, I was five. Five, yeah. Well, then my father went to work for Billy McLean that had the Thorpe Swatling work, see? Mm -hmm. And uh, he was there. Is that where they bought their bottles for oh, the brewing? Where did they buy their bottles? Oh, I here? couldn't tell you. Uh, uh, but they what? weren't made in Nelson. Oh, no, no, no. no okay, no, that's what no. I was wondering. No, they, they come from a, uh, a supply house of some kind. Yeah, well, I imagine that most of them were probably made in the States mm -hmm. then. Uh, but uh, then he went to work there for uh, uh, Thorpe yeah, Swatland Works. And what were they bottling? Soft drinks, ah. uh, ginger ale and uh, ginger all of these things, see. And, uh, uh, he was there not many months when uh, they uh, they had a brewer there. Uh, I don't know whether he quit or uh, uh, whether he got fired, but uh, Gosnell got my father back there, and my father brewed them from 1910 till. Uh, the last day of 1924, and he left the Nelson Brewery then. And uh, he was out of work then uh, from January, February, March, April, May, until September. And uh, he got a, a, a phone call from uh, Revelstoke and, uh, and offered him this job uh, up there as brewmaster in the Enterprise Brewery in Revelstoke. So he was, he was there from September 1925 till uh, uh, January, February 1928. And, uh, was he away from the family? Did you all stay yeah, here? Yeah, but a couple summers my mother and uh, and the girls went up to Revelstoke right. but the rest of the time they were here so the kids could yeah, go to school. school and yeah. yeah and uh, so then he uh, stayed in the hotel up there uh, 
Royal Hotel. There's people by name a lot, and they're related to these lot kids here. And then, uh, then uh, that was 1928. And then he was home here then till. Uh, Month now, in 1933, I think it was. I forgot now whether it was in the spring or in the summer. Uh, he, uh, uh, the uh, bury over here called him and uh, asked him uh, if he would go up to Princeton. And he went to Princeton. He was there for uh, from 33. To 35. Uh, it was better than two years up there, and uh, that's the last place he ever brewed. And, and, but now, do you want to know about the other breweries in the district? Yeah, but just I just want to just want to clear up one thing that we still had only the one in Nelson. Uh, uh, oh, is that uh, from that, in 1910? Oh no, no. Uh, there was yeah, there was only one. Then. That's right. Nelson, uh, there was only one in Nelson after 1902. Uh huh. Okay. So there's still only yeah. the one here. Yeah. Okay. But one thing I missed in there, uh, when my father's uncle took in a partner, mm -hmm. and they uh, in 1898. They uh, they brought a bigger brew kettle uh -huh. and an ice plant and all of these things, uh -huh. and they took the old stuff that my father had uh -huh. on the, the um, uh, expo site, Swain's uh, Cooperage site, that later, you know, in Vancouver, Paul Street. Uh -huh. That the stuff they brought up to Nelson in 1893, uh -huh. they sent to sold to a brewery that started up in Moyer. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and the times I've gone through Moyer, I've wondered where that brewery was. Yeah. yeah. So that stuff there went to Moyer. How were they, fi how was the financing for the, say, for buying the ice plant? Did they, oh, well, did they get shares or It, it or was and? different then than it is now. Yeah. And it, uh, like you were telling Kay that you read some of my letters mm -hmm. uh, in the paper. Do you remember one letter that I wrote and I pointed out about all the dairies and all the uh, uh, grocery stores mm -hmm. and all of that? Well, but they, they invested in the town. Basically. Yeah, that's right. But uh, they worked on consignment and that's how my father built his brewery. I he see. had two homes on Latimer Street. He lost those with the brewery. Uh -huh. uh, but um, Everything was on consignment, see, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, they would go, they'd start up, they probably had a little money, you know, uh, for a down payment, and uh, then they would get uh, uh, credit from the wholesalers mm -hmm. and from the manufacturers that uh, manufactured uh, the ice plants and the, the other machinery and the boiler, steam boiler that they had and all of that and the bottles and the malt and the hops and so on. They would get that and then be on consignment. That's how most of these hotels yeah. were. Started, Sturgeon started in a tent down there. And uh, uh, Madden's started with the, the frame building that you saw on the uh, calendar there, you know, with the Madden House, mm -hmm. 1888 yeah. on the top. Well, those were all built on consignment. Mm -hmm. And so were the breweries. Yeah. And uh, then, they, but a lot of them, become wealthy, you know. Mm -hmm. And my father said that his uncle, when he died, he left a, an estate of $70,000. Now, just imagine in 1902, mm -hmm. what that would be today. Mm -hmm. That would be over $700,000, mm -hmm. close to a million. And uh, uh, Did he have a family? Is there a reaster of family from that family? Sure. The here? first, uh, there was one boy, was uh, with the first uh, children the, when they opened up St. Joseph's School mm -hmm. in Nelson. This reaster uh, 
house the first nuns that come to Nelson to uh, build. Did you know that? No. And uh, uh, to build and they the, built the convent. Yeah. Right. And, and they came out here in 1900. See, mm -hmm. and they come out from uh, New, 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 New Jersey. New York, New Jersey. And uh, two nuns, and they already had a. Uh, St. Joseph's uh, Sisters Hospital in Rossville, oh, okay. see, it was built in 1896. Right. So they used to go over to Rossland and then they'd come back and they stayed at my father's uncle's house. Okay. What was your father's uncle's wife's name? Her name was, um, oh heck, uh, it's up in the cemetery, and I think I had it here. But the daughter's name was uh, uh, Clara, Clara Dorothy. Clara Richard. Yeah, and I don't know, the mothers might have been Dorothy too, or Clara, I'm not sure. And then were there other children? Yeah, two. Uh, Charlie uh, was the oldest one, and then there was uh, Bob, was the second, and then this Clara. Uh, was born in Nelson. The other two were born in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And uh, this Charlie Reister, he uh, was a civil engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he was only uh, 13 when they left Nelson. And uh, his brother Bob was uh, 11. And this Dor Dorothy, Clara Dorothy, was 8. Mm -hmm. And after their father died in 1900. They left here in 1905, and uh, they went, uh, those three kids on their own, and they took the train here, and then the boat up to Arrow Lakes, and then to Revelstoke mm -hmm. by train and down to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And this Benson's that the Benson Street's named after, uh, was one of the guardians. Mm -hmm. And another fella by the name of MacArthur that had a furniture store in uh, Caswell in the early days, and also one in Nelson, like uh, where the Walter Waste Corner is mm -hmm. now, like you call it Broken Hill Block, or that was the Aberdeen Block, or Griffin, Griffin Block. Block. I get those two twisted. Yeah. Griffin. Okay. And uh, they were the guardians, right. and they went and they lived with the Bensons there, and yeah. then went to uh, school and then to university, mm -hmm. and then this Charlie, he went overseas. First World War, and uh, he was badly wounded, and uh, he came back, and he never went to engineering anymore. He uh, he got the franchise for the whole of British Columbia for the Austin cars. Do you remember the English yeah, car? Yeah, yeah. And then after that, he uh, went to Penticton, and uh, he and another fella had the uh, Ford uh, cars in Penticton and Okanagan. And then after that, when he retired, he built a, a motel mm -hmm. complex at, uh, I think. So none of them ever Park. lived here? No, not no. after their children, no. Yeah, we mean, were the only family that the parents there. are buried in the Nelson in Cemetery? In Nelson Cemetery, oh, yeah. Parents. yeah. And that was the only ones of that, the, your father yes. and that one were the only ones that yes. Milwaukee yes. came up yeah. with. I, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so now let's go through the whole district in 1910 yeah. and see what other bureaus well, there are. Uh, I'll start from earlier than 1910, okay. from the beginning. Uh, there was um, four or five at Rossland, because Rossland was booming. Booming big, yeah. there was a... Uh, uh, over 10,000 people there, right. and uh, there was uh, the one, their biggest brewery was called the Leroy, and I don't know the names of the other one. That name, the mine. Correct. Yeah, then down the trail, there was one uh, called the Golden Drops, uh, <laughs> and it was uh, uh, right when you come down from, uh, have you been up, uh, coming down from the gatehouse of the smelter? Yeah. You come down that steep hill right. and you get on to Rossland Avenue. Well, straight ahead there used to be a hotel mm -hmm. called the uh, uh, Kootenai. Yeah, the Kootenai Hotel. Yeah. You can go uh, to the Kootenai. Yeah. That was originally a brewery, they say. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then they had their other brewery, they called it the Columbia Brewery. 
was a brick place up next to, you know, where the um, uh, Italian, uh, what do they call it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, it's right next door to it. Okay. And uh, then, uh, uh, now, I guess, maybe I should say there was a one at Phoenix, one at Greenwood, one at Grand Forks, or two at Grand Forks. Uh, there was... Um, Uh, one at Sandon, one at Cody, one at Caslow, one at Moyer, like I was telling you, and then there was one at Weimar, would you believe that? No, well, Weimar was booming too. Yeah, you know, Weimar, there were 16 saloons at Weimar. Yeah. And uh, uh, there was... Um, was there one on the Silver King? No. Never. No. no. That was all supplied from now. Yeah. Pulled up there, Rabbi. Yeah, Ooh. the tram. Yeah. Oh, the tram line. They oh, I the think. Ah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So how about um, the slow camp? Slow camp? How about at the slow camp? Uh, well, slow camp city? Uh, there was, uh, I never heard of one in slow camp city, but there was uh, one in San New Denver? Uh, no. Uh, Silver Tempers? No. There was Rebel Stoke, though. The cup? No. Uh, but, yeah, and Sandon, okay. and uh, how about in the Cody. Lardo? How about Eaton and Ferguson? No, that and... all used to come from the uh, Reister Brewery, oh, and, really? the, and then the other breweries. Because they would go on the boat, they'd load yeah, up the Nelson sure. on the yeah. on the company sure. or on the whatever. Yeah, sure. There. I see. Whew. Okay, so so your did your father supply the CPR and the GN boat? Uh, oh yeah, the uh, or yeah they, they had. I, I think they got it because they I, have saloons on the boats, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know about the. Uh, oh, most likely they did though, because they would uh, see the the Great Northern. They had their boat. Uh, one was called the uh, Caslow, wasn't it? Yeah, the Caslow. The and and the, the international. International. The yeah. Argenta. The yeah. Uh, the one that was started with a Ainsworth. Yeah, that was the uh, uh, Ainsworth itself, wasn't it? And it sank on that wharf there. Right. And then there was another one that sank uh, by Pilot Bay, and that was a great northern one, I think. Yeah, the, there was 14 lives lost on that, and yeah. uh, a big storm. Uh, um, uh, let's see how. There was a man by the name of Lean, who was the captain, I think. This big, and these were all Italians. Uh, there were workers that were working on the Crow's Nest line. They got on a Cuscan up or something like that. Some tragedies. Okay, so let's look at my list here. Okay. Did any other liquor get made around here? Moonshine. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, legal. <laughs> no, I, I never heard of it. There was no distillery. No, no, the only distilleries are over in the Okanagan. Uh huh. I never heard of any. I think I would have. But there was lots of moonshine, man. Yeah, and wine. I guess people yeah. made their own. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Did they make any moonshine during prohibition? If you don't, yeah, I'm going to just ask him about yeah. prohibition now. Okay, yeah. now let's talk about prohibition. Yeah. Okay. The American Prohibition came in when? It yeah. came in after the uh, after 18? British Columbia. Alberta came in after British Columbia. Okay. When did we, when were we? Pardon? When was our Prohibition law passed? Nelson. Yeah. And I think it was October 1917. Okay. So, what was the effect on the, on Bury on the? Well, everything went underground, I guess. You know, they made the real beer too, and uh, like uh, uh, they were just as crooked then as they are now. Mm -hmm. And they made the real good beer, you know, and uh, certain people got it, you know. Mm -hmm. In those days, they used to have a team of horses and also a single rig, you know, one horse. And they used to deliver to all the family around whoever wanted beer, you know. There so was, there was, was no it wasn't all sold, sold through one outlet or anything no, like no, that? No, no, no. 
No, I oh. went right from the brewery, you see. I see. And uh, a lot of people used to buy it by the barrel. Mm -hmm. That'd be ten decimal in a barrel. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then there was the bootleggers, you see. Yeah. And they'd buy uh, one or two or three barrels of beer whenever the coast was clear and they mm -hmm. could get them there without the police being around. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, or maybe they got the police and given a few beers over in this corner while they went out that. Well, corner. was there a BC law like total, or was it passed individually in each town? Well, 1922 is when they uh, they uh, they called it local option, mm -hmm. and they went back then, and then they were uh, it had to come out of a liquor store. And you had to have, there was no brewery delivery. It mm -hmm. had to go from the liquor store, or else the requisition to come from the liquor store. Mm -hmm. And the Nelson Brewery would uh, deliver it. Old Charlie Watts was the man mm -hmm. that did the delivery. But uh, uh, they, uh, uh, Mr. Scanlon, you've heard of him, Tom Scanlon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. Uh, a prominent uh, uh, Catholic here, you know, and uh, uh, he lived on Stanley Street above where trainers lived on Stanley Street. You know where that, right straight across from Heron's store, if you remember where that was. No, where was that? On Stanley Street, right above the Central School, uh, in the 900 block. Yes, okay, now yeah. I'm aware, yeah. Well, Stanley, there, he was the excise inspector. Okay. And he used to have to go up to the brewery, I guess, after every brew. Uh -huh. And my father would have to show him the, the books and that, you know, and uh, how much he brewed, and of course, they'd be taxed accordingly, mm -hmm. the excise tax. Okay, so they were still brewing, but they were brewing in all, I mean, legally, but they were, the, what they were brewing legally was a very small percentage of alcohol. Well, what they were brewing legally, yes, was 2%. 2%. They used to call it belly wash. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and you called it near beer before. Yeah, that was what they called and it. And that beer. was allowed to be, this was so that the beer producers wouldn't completely go out of business, I guess. Yeah. They produced this. Um, hmm. And uh, they had uh, uh, all the old uh, hard drinkers, you know, and that. They drink that because of nothing better, but they used to call it belly wash because mm -hmm. that's what they used to sober up on when they were right. drinking the hard liquor or moonshine. <laughs> okay, well, so what happened to all our pubs in Prohibition? They were all closed? Sure, there was no, uh, they didn't uh, have a beer party until uh, uh, 1931 here. Between 19. 17. Yeah. And 1931? Yeah. That's why there was lots of bootleggers. Yeah. See, and they used to... They closed all... Well, how did all those hotels survive without... Well, which? The hotels. How did they survive? That's, they, had to, they had to bootleg for to, yeah. to, to stay... To survive. Yeah. And uh, like uh, all of the hotels, he would tell on all of them. Yeah. That, that, that's the only way they could keep... How did they do it? Like to the rooms? How, how did they... Oh. They used to, uh, uh, <laughs> lots of times, they they served it in the right in, in the, the toilet rooms, you know. Oh, and then they'd have the door locked and people would think that it was occupied and they'd be <laughs> and they're drinking. And, oh. and, and old Mrs. Uh, Kate Bank, and then while well, she was a slicker at it, uh, oh. she used to, and, the, and the, with whiskey too. And they said that early in the morning, uh, I had fellas tell me this that uh, at the New Grand when they bought it, you know, first they had a hotel and trail called the Globe Hotel. It was right down at the end of Bay Avenue, okay. uh, right down uh, like uh, right the Trafalgar. Uh, well, right where, where school is? the junior high. That no, the uh, what do you call it? Used to be across from at the uh, Trail Tadnight Hospital, and uh, right ahead of it was uh, uh, the Smelter. Oh, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, uh, she used to have her come on it. She'd get up about 6 o'clock in the morning and she'd stick this swaddle in under her come on and she'd go around and she'd knock at the door. She knew which ones had a hangover and she'd sell them two or three or four <laughs> drinks. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, uh, 
Oh, Mrs. Montalian. They used to call her Big Liz. You've yeah. probably heard that name. Yeah. Well, she used to uh, have uh, where the Shamrock Grill is now. Right. And it was supposed to be a little grocery store. And uh, she she used to uh, uh, move like there too. And uh, I remember... Uh, you mean between 1922 and 1931, there was a no, local no. auction, but Nelson always voted against? That's right. Trail had it, Weimer had it, Samo had it, uh, Pinehurst Inn, that's also a canyon over the yeah. road, turned the old road and went down to cross the railroad yeah. track. Yeah, Pinehurst Inn, they had it. That was Mr. Lee? Pardon? Was that Mr. Lee's dad? Or, or no, uh, Gansner? Uh, no, Gansner was out there before uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, before Prohibition, and no. but uh, uh, Kenny Campbell was a member of parliament for Nelson, liberal candidate, right. and he built this hotel out there called the Pinehurst Inn, and, they and had, he, got, he got a license, see? And Nelson voted against it? Sure. Year after year? Yeah. Then finally, they got it in... Uh, in That's I, all our United uh, Church types. Uh, <laughs> all our United Church politicians in Nelson, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a better one than that. Oh. There was a man in Nelson, don't put that down. No. Is that on? Yes, don't tell us. <laughs> you don't want to do it down <laughs> It has a pause function. I want to hear it. <laughs> okay. He'll, he'll close it off for a minute. Thank you. So it was about, during Prohibition, they paid up to $25 a bottle. Yes. Wow. And, and you know, they used to, uh, you could get booze uh, if you went to the doctor and you right. got a uh, prescription. Per, uh, prescription, yeah. And they used to pay the doctor a dollar for that and they would go and they would get their bottle and they used to bring it in from Alberta and that. And now I'm going to tell you a good, a good one. This uh, happened here in the old city hall when it was down Front Street, you know. Um, Mayor McQuarrie, uh, when the flu was on in 1918, and Armistice Day uh, was a, a sunny day, but it was oh, way below, I think, around zero. Mm -hmm. And in the daytime, but the sun was, you know, no heat in it. And uh, 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 Armistice was declared on uh, November 11th, 11th in, in, on the 11th hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, by golly, that afternoon, they got a Nelson transfer, that's the Ferguson's, you know, a flat deck uh, wagon, and they pulled it up on Baker Street between the Canada Drug, you know, that was the um, KWC. KWC yeah, block yeah. and, and the uh, uh, Walter Wage Corner. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then they put some steps up to it, and all the big shots, Father Althoff and uh, Mayor McQuarrie, and uh, I don't know who else. Mayor McQuarrie uh, was a real estate man. Uh, with, it was called McQuarrie and Robertson, and they had their uh, uh, real estate office in the uh, Griffin Block, down just above where Poulin's office mm -hmm. is now, like where he went down to, <laughs> down to uh, the Bone Studio, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, he lost his only son uh, in the First World War, just shortly before that. And he, had, he got up there, and he was a cripple, you know, he had a cane and a big high heel. And he got a chill, I guess, and he took the flu. And uh, he made his speech, and it must have been heartbreaking, you know, and it was so darn cold, and they had to rush up to uh, the Silver King mine, they brought down, uh, they had a telephone up to there and a watchman and a watchman snowshoed so far to meet the other guy going up to get a pull motor. You know, that'd be like uh, they use now to the common respirator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, For him. Yeah, mm -hmm. but he died. And uh, so the city council decided then and there, you know, that they should send away and get a gallon of brandy, and they sent to Alberta, I think, for it. So they put that gallon of brandy 
<laughs> in the, you know where the, were you ever in the old city hall? Yeah. You remember the, when you walked in on the left hand, the first door on the left hand side was the engineer's office. Mr. Affleck was in yeah. there. Yeah. And then, and then you walked a little further and on the right hand side was the general office for the, where you paid your taxes yeah. and everything. Yeah. And old Bill Watson had his office at the back further on that yeah. side. Well, then you went upstairs to the council chambers and to the police thing. Were you ever in jail? No. Did you know where that uh, the, the police little courtroom was? Well, they, Watson was, you know, he was tighter than bark on a tree. He uh, he knew where every nickel went, you know, and I think that they'd buy a dozen lead pencils a year and he'd put them in the vault at night. And he was that tight. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was, but he, uh, so he, he took this underneath those stairs in the engineer's office, there was a cupboard. Uh -huh. And he, they had kept all their stationery and everything in there, so he put the gallon of brandy in, in there. there. And there was an electrical engineer by the name of McGuire. And <laughs> an Irishman. And he, uh, he was in there to get uh, envelopes or something, and he spotted this. Well, he nipped away at this and, <laughs> and nipped away at it. So one time they had the uh, the first council meeting of the year in January, uh, or it might have been towards the end of January because he used to hold their election right. in January. So they. They had a, a good report that uh, the city uh, had uh, done, well. Uh, done well. They didn't have to raise taxes and they had a surplus. So he says to them, these old guys, and some of them like to sort, and some of them were pretty tight too, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. stingy. Mm -hmm. So he said, gentlemen, he says, I think this calls for a drink. So. They had nodded their heads and they thought it was a good idea. And this was, prohibition was, I mean, uh, uh, the flu was gone by, you know. So he goes out. <laughs> <laughs> he, he come in and you could have hung your hat on his eyes, you know, and with the empty jug. Oh, no. And Ed Simpson, you probably know that name. He was the uh, uh, electrical superintendent. And... Uh, he told me this story, uh, and he was there for years, and I forget what happened, but anyway, he had told me this story. And, oh, you told me three or four, but that one was a price one. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> okay, um, somebody told me there used to be a trail at the Beaver Canyon for rum running to the state during Prohibition. Does that ring any bells to you? Uh, no, but I'll tell you, the, uh, there was one uh, uh, at uh, Fernie that used to run uh, down into Montana. Uh, the uh, Picarillo, his name was. So, do you know any stories about smuggling to the state? Smuggling? Uh, no, oh yeah, there was one. There was a, a CPR, not CPR, Great Northern. Uh, uh, what was he? The Express messenger, I think. Uh, and they were both in the one car, the baggage man and the express messenger. And there was a mail clerk. That's it. Uh, and this fella was. Uh, Taking it across all the time uh, to uh, uh, to Spokane and different places along there, and the FBI uh, got wind of it, and by golly, they uh, they got on the uh, I don't know whether it was at Northport. Mm -hmm. They got on and they uh, wanted him to open up the safe, you know, on the train where they had, I guess, money orders and all the mail and stuff. And he wouldn't do it. And uh, uh, anyway, 
They stayed with him right till he got, I think it was to Spokane, which is the end of the route. And uh, then they arrested him. And I did hear how much he got, I think it was seven years or something like that. This man's name, uh, well, I won't mention it anyway, because I don't What's know. What's that, Somebody in the kitchen. Oh. Um. Okay. And, and, but he got caught. Okay, um, so Nelson, I think that must have been very difficult for the hotel at uh, one time. And that, oh, I'm going to tell you a good story, too. And, and Caswell, you know, Caswell was hit hard, see? And uh, uh, the hotels that were up there were much like the Madden, and mm -hmm. they looked after their own. Mm -hmm. And the slow can was good for that. And uh, there was great big fires uh, uh, up in the Lardo. Mm -hmm. And uh, like when these squatters used to come through, you know, the bootleggers, they had a big long chain, you know, mm -hmm. and go all the way from the boundary all the way to the gross mm -hmm. I guess. And uh, they would phone ahead, see. And the dog, when they used to get pinched, it used to be uh, $300. And court costs, see? and they, um, so I think they all used to chip in and help each other, you know, like if I if I got pinched this yeah, time, yeah, you you, you give me ten dollars right. right or so to help towards it, and so it wouldn't be such a a blow. Well, anyway, how about the, paying off the police? Was there much of that? Well, I think Is it was, you know of? No, no, I never I never knew about, but there was a. Uh, and I think there was some of it done because mm -hmm. some of them were pretty well fixed, I think. Yeah. Please. But this is a, a story shows you how smart uh, these two stool pigeons, they call them, they kept through, and I don't know whether they had got to Trailer Rossland or somewhere, but they phoned Caslow mm -hmm. and uh, all the places uh, along the Grapevine Lake. And so. They, uh, They're coming. Yeah, and so Caswell. Everybody was, be ready for it. Caswell was waiting for him. Yeah. And these great big uh, forest fires. So the forest ranger, he went, and uh, they could recruit you off the street, you know, right. it didn't make any difference who you were. Right. And they still they, can. Yeah, so they took these, <laughs> these two guys, <laughs> and they were great. <laughs> You know, with, with little with shoes, you know, and suit. yeah, the nice <laughs> suit and a tie and all of that, and it was hotter than the blue lake. <laughs> and they took them way up, uh, way up in the Lardo, uh, way up on one of those high peaks, you know, when there was a good fire going, you know, <laughs> and these poor devils were choking with the smoke and these lousy clo uh, shoes and stuff. There were blisters and everything, you know. So they were kept them up there for a couple of weeks or more. <laughs> they drank up all the beer and gamble. <laughs> no, they were way up in the. Oh, I see. No, but I mean, so yeah. they got really but this is what happened, uh, right. John. They they kept them up there, and uh, when uh, they then finally, like they were there better in a couple of weeks, and uh, they brought them down to Castle. When they got them down to Castle, they said, "Now you sobs." We knew who you were. Now, you get the hell out of here, or we got another one for you. And if we ever see your face here again, you got off lucky this time. <laughs> I never heard of another squatter in this country after that. That's right. Yeah. Boy, they were pretty smooth. Okay, now I should ask you, like, I, I asked you before, was Nelson Ruffin Neal in the early days? I mean... No. Uh, like um, all these Kootenai towns were good because uh, you know um, they had a good police and they uh, did we have the provincial police or yeah yeah we had we almost had our city police yeah and uh, and then on top of it, there was a provincial police for the outskirts mm -hmm. but anytime people got rough and gay around here you know they uh, they. Oh, lovely! They'd, uh, 
they would really give them a good beating. Uh -huh. And uh, they never, now like at Ross, you know, they used to, in the early, early days when it started, uh, they usually come up from uh, Montana and the Court of Lanes, and there were these guys, uh, uh, tin horns, gamblers, you know, and uh, all that rough refract, you know. Uh, and uh, they would come up, they'd have uh, a six shooter or something. And there was a big policeman called Jack Kirkup. You've probably heard of that name. He was an early one here, too. Mm -hmm. and then he went to Rossman. Big Jack. Uh, oh, big, tall guy. He used to carry pardon? a big stick and beat people. He, that, a big uh, whip with, uh, loaded with lead. And anyway, this guy used to walk down to. Um, Patterson, you know, that's mm -hmm. before he gets to run for it. And he used to meet them. They'd be coming up. This was before the railroads were there. Mm -hmm. And it was rough and tough. You know. And they'd come up. And uh, he'd tell them, well, now, yeah, you give me your guns. Uh, mm -hmm. And when, he was when, you, uh, when you leave, uh, uh, when you leave, you'll get your guns back, you know. But you're not having them in British Columbia. I see. So and, uh, so there were one or two or so that would uh, get smart, you know, and he used to give them a, a good wallop across the seat of their intellect, you know. Like <laughs> <laughs> they never heard, they never come back. Mm -hmm. So yeah. basically the police were very effective. It was the same here, and we had a policeman here, uh, Alex Stewart. That was a big, powerful man, and he had even one time in 1909 when the rink that was on Paul Mines Road, the big rink, it was the best rink uh, west in Western Canada when it was built. The Patrick's mm -hmm. famous party. Nelson Rink Limited. Yeah. Well, anyway, they brought a special train from Rossland and then Trail. Alex Stewart uh, was a policeman in Rossland then, mm -hmm. and he'd come over here to, uh, to uh, fight this, I think his name was Bob Fitzsimmons or some name like that. And uh, he was an ex-champion of the world. So they had that fight. And... Uh, they had him at the rink? Yeah, in the skating rink. Yeah. They had it packed full. They, mm -hmm. they were on the... Uh, they had their ring, you know, in mm -hmm. the center, like where the ice space would be. And but this was in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And uh, he... Uh, uh, they went a couple of rounds or so, and uh, uh, this Fitzsimmons told him, I think that was his name, told him, uh, uh, he says, now he says, don't get rough, he says, and we'll have a good fight, an honest fight, but he says, don't try and get rough. And uh, so Alex Stewart was hitting and getting hit a little bit harder, a little bit harder, and he thought, well, he had him. And so this fellow says, well, he's all right, he says, watch now. And he knocked him flying. But Stuart was a good boxer and he wasn't afraid of anybody. But he wasn't a trained no. yeah, champion of the world. And, and uh, he used to put them in, I'm going to tell you, they used to take them down there and beat the hell out of some of these roughnecks that come. And they knew it. Yeah, they knew it. They didn't fool around with him. And then Big Bar Parshaw that was here in your day, mm -hmm. uh, he didn't take any no. uh, guff from any of them. No. He was quiet about it, but when they when he hit them, they knew they were hit. Mm -hmm. And then there was oh another time they were uh, having a Rosslyn and Nelson were having a, a, a baseball game and. Uh, I forget whether it was a playoff or whether it was some big event anyway. And the game was in Nelson. And uh, they had a lot of, Rosslyn had a lot of imported uh, Spokane mm -hmm. fellas, you know, ball players like from Gonzaga and those places. And uh, Nelson had a couple. And uh, there was a lot of betting going on and there were some big stakes at Rosslyn. And uh, they found out here, Emmett Kirby, I don't know if you remember that name, the Kirby's used to live on Mill Street. There was a couple of girls and a couple of boys. 
and their father had a little cigar store across from the Queen's Hotel. But before that, he had been a woods foreman, logging woods foreman. George's he, uh, George yeah. he got uh, uh, one of these uh, announcement players that they heard uh, was uh, bribed and was going to dump the game. Uh -huh. So they, uh, this Evan Kirby, he got, uh, he was the manager of the ball club. And he got them into his store and in the back room, the card room, and he said, no, he said, we'll never talk to you. And he said, no, he says, we know what's up. And if you dump the game, you won't get out of here alive. They'll beat you to death. Mm -hmm. And so he put the fear in them. And uh, uh, one of the um, Rossman players went over to one of the Nelson players that had been a Spokane player too, and they said, said now how, how do you fix this? The guy's name was Red Flaherty. He became a famous football star in the, in the States after that. He gave up baseball, but he was a good ball player too. So they said, well, uh, uh, keep the ball high. Uh, don't pitch low to him, keep the ball high. So they threw the ball, <laughs> he knocked it out the ball way up to where the, the new curling rink is. <laughs> oh, and uh, Nelson won the game. And uh, <laughs> he told him the wrong But there was crooks then, too. Yeah, oh, well, sure. Yeah. Okay, just a minute, let's see. Um, can you name me some of the other men that were involved in the brewery business? Some family names of men, your father's associate. Uh, uh, well, there was uh, um, uh, first, like I've already told you about. Rolly. Uh, yeah, and uh, then. Uh, Blomberg. Uh, uh, Gosnell uh, was uh, the next manager after uh, my father's uncle and uh, Rolly. Rolly. Then Gosnell. Uh, when it was sold at state. Gosnell came up and he was there till uh, he died in, I think it was 1920. Mm -hmm. He's buried up here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he was followed by George Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. George Hawthorne had been the accountant and that at the brewery all those years. And uh, he became the next manager. Well, then he died. The day before Father Altov died, uh, it was uh, Father Altov died on the 30th of December, and and uh, Hawthorne died on the 29th of December. Of what year? 1925. Yeah, I thought it was there. Yeah. Yeah. Because <clears throat> my father was uh, was uh, uh, was home for uh, he used to take his uh, holidays. Uh, uh, Christmas, well, time? Uh, Christmas and New Year's had to be the slack yeah. time, you know, and that's when he could get away. Yeah. So he used to take 10 days. And uh, he was here, and uh, uh, then the next one was this Wally Thompson that I've mentioned him before that mm -hmm. had the liquor store and an mm -hmm. office saloon. Mm -hmm. He became the next manager. And then uh, after him. So we're still dealing in the Alston Brewery, right yeah. up till 20. Well, and then. Uh, when did we get. No, wait a minute. Coke uh, and uh, 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 I tell you, uh, 19. Uh, I think it was 1924 or 25 that uh, the Trail Brewery was owned by two brothers. Their name was. Uh, Mueller and uh, or Miller uh, and one the brewer of the two brothers he was in they used to varnish their casks and kettles and that you know so that they wouldn't get sour and of course that was a very dangerous job to do and you had to wear a respirator see and uh, and like my father always used to and the brewery here, 
He always used to have one man stand at the kettle, see, because the kettle is closed in, and there's only a space about uh, this big for you to reach in and stir the brew in that, you know, with the strainer kind of a spoon. Well, he always used to, and they could only stay in so many 20 minutes, and then they'd have to come out and the other guy go in. Mm -hmm. Well, this miller, like a lot of those Germans or Dutchmen, they're uh, stubborn too, you know. And uh, he was the boss, and he went in there, and I don't think there was anybody there with him. And they went in, and they found him on the bottom of the cask. I think it was the kettle where they make the beer, for the beer in. They found him in there, he was dead. So the other brother, he came over, his name was Fritz. I don't know what the other one's name was. And he came over to my father, and he wanted my father to uh, to quit and come over there, and, or he'd sell out. Was this the Golden Drops or the Columbia? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. And, uh, it was, and it was called uh, the Columbia Brewery then, see? And uh, uh, so my father went to Hawthorne, that was the manager, and he said to Hawthorne, he said, uh, uh, how about you and I taking over that brewery? And Hawthorne, he turned around and he went and told the shareholders the brewery, and they bought it out, and that's when it became, they called it the Cooney Brewery. Brewery Limited. Yeah. KBL. Well, huh? KBL for years. Yeah. And uh, then uh, they uh, they weren't satisfied with that. They went to Cranbrook about 1930 or something like that, and they bought, they bought out the Cranbrook Brewery. And then they went up and they bought out the Barney Fork Steel Brewery. And it was a good brewery. Mm -hmm. And uh, But that when was that? That was uh, well, it, this was all in the Depression time, and they had the whole work, so then they call it the interior brewery. Right. Yeah. yeah, and uh, then... But all the beer wasn't made in Nelson. No. No, there were branches. The, uh, these were all yeah. separate hotels, right. but then they, they were, uh, but they had brewers in each. Yeah. No, wait, I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. They closed. They closed the Cranbrook Brewery and they closed the... Trailer? After a while they did, and uh -huh. it was only a warehouse. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, they had all of these, and uh, then they turned around, and there was a guy from Lethbridge come in, and R.D. Barnes was the manager then, Dick Barnes. Uh -huh. And uh, this guy, I think his name was McFarland. And he'd come, and then when uh, Barnes, but he, I don't think he went to prison. I think he died. Mm -hmm. uh, I think now. Um, well, no, that's um, uh, McFarland. That's the last name I remember, because mm -hmm. uh, it was over at Preston then. Uh, mm -hmm. Barnes was the manager. How about when John Herb was here? John Herbs was a brewer. Uh, uh, like when my father left. Barnes uh, the brewery, was the manager. And yeah, Barnes never knew anything about well, brewery. None of those managers yeah. did. Uh, uh, when my father left the brewery in 1924, the last day in 1924, right. there was a man by the name of Groves that came and he was there for. Two or three years, I think, and uh, he, well, he might have been four years. And then um, uh, there was a man by the name of Wiener come, mm -hmm. and they had been at Phoenix. And the Phoenix, when the town of Phoenix closed, they left, and he went down to Mexico City or something mm -hmm. like that. And then uh, uh, he came back, and uh, they let. Uh, Groves go, and Beener got the job, and uh, I, I forget who was in the in the trail, and uh, Beener uh, went after them, and he, he said, "Now he said, 
there's no reason why I can't uh, ruin both buries mm -hmm. uh, in the other car, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he, he would get $500 a month then, see? Mm -hmm. $500 a month in the no depression. Okay, uh, that, uh, that was a chicken feed. Mm -hmm. So he was there, Wiener was there then till. Uh, I forget what what year it was. Uh, I don't think he was there until '35, mm -hmm. and then uh, John Herb got me. John Herb was there uh, till they moved to Preston, and he went to Preston with them. And I forgot what year it was. I think it was in the '50s that mm -hmm. they went to uh, Preston, mm -hmm. close out this very mm -hmm. year. Then I don't know, and then I heard there was a man by the name of Jacobson after that, but I don't know, he might still be there. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Um, I think we've exhausted the breweries. Should I have our, I think we've exhausted the breweries for now, and we can take a break and have your sure. tea, and then we can maybe talk for a few minutes about yeah. the other the yeah. waterfront stuff. Oh, okay. yeah. So turn it off for a few minutes, and then we'll. Well, you, you wanted my history too. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have some tea. You look a little tired. And you know, I had chances to be other places. Uh, like uh, uh, when I was in like uh, 1942, uh, I got my call, you know, inscription. Mm -hmm. The same time as Jack and Jim Madden and Bill Moraro and a lot of us are on that age, it come to certain ages. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought, well, my uh, my father and mother were actually my dependents. And, you know, I wasn't married and uh, I had my little plumbing shop in the basement here. But I thought, well, I'm not going to uh, live with uh, uh, uncertainty over my head if uh, my two brothers were in there. Mm -hmm. My youngest brother was in the Navy. And uh, my uh, brother Ernie, uh, as he used to work in the wood balance one time, uh, he he was in the uh, ordnance corps in the army. So I thought, well, uh, I went down to one well, the day I got my call. I went down to Doctor Borden, mm -hmm. and I got an exam, and uh, I wanted to find out if I was medically fit. And he said, why? He says, I think he said, you'll be B1. And uh, so I went over then to the armory, you know, uh, and that's where the recruiting office was. So I went in there and I told uh, the recruiting sergeant and the, and the army captain, the recruiting captain was there too. And uh, so I told him, I said, now I said, I would join active service but I'd have to have at least one month before I go because I said I had a lot of jobs that I've started and I said I've collected money on some of them mm -hmm. and I said I can't walk out and lead these people. So they said, well, you go ahead, you take your month. And uh, I signed up on that and uh, uh, they said, now if you need more time, uh, we'll give it to you. So. I worked, I had a heating job in Castle Gar, and I had a couple of jobs, one for Ted Grizzell and one for Vincent Pink's father. And uh, I finished those, and you know that I actually worked uh, till uh, 9 o'clock at night, the night before I got on the train to go. And mm -hmm. uh, the last place I went down was to the Kinahans, because mm -hmm. they had been one of my first customers, and the two, Mrs. Boyd and, and Winnie Kinahan, uh, they needed the water shut off in the yard, and the, their brothers were away. So I went down, and when I got finished, I never emptied my tool bag. My father emptied that on the bench after I had left, and uh, my mom said he'd come up and he was wiping his eyes, because <laughs> the uh, tool bag was uh, there. So I I went and uh, I never was on a sick parade in the army and 
that, and I made all the root markers and everything that they had to do, and, uh, and then, uh, like, they put me in the engineers, because I was a plumber, see, so, uh, they figured, uh, the army examiner uh, up at Vernon told me, I was had my basic training up there, and I was going to go to the ordinance for it, I thought, see, because my brother Ernie was in that, and he said, no, he says, uh, you don't want to go to the ordinance court. He said, you'd be stuck in a store. And he said, handing out things and stuff. And he said, uh, uh, they need you in the shops, the railway shops. So they sent me from uh, uh, Chilliwack, uh, where I had my separate training engineers camp, uh, to uh, Stratford, Ontario. And they were mobilizing the railway corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was quite a few. I met quite a few Nelson down mm -hmm. there, uh, fellows that worked in the shop, yeah. and railroaders and uh, telegraphers and so on. And uh, I passed my trades test. I passed my uh, uh, dental and uh, everything at Chilliwack. They sent me to Stratford, Ontario. Then we were uh, there for. I guess a couple of weeks just parading around one thing or another, and uh, uh, we were built in a great big, uh, I think it was Kroller was the name, furniture factory, a great big huge four-story building, and uh, we had uh, our, uh, what they were called, hut, our sleeping quarters up on the very top floor, and this was in July, and, oh, oh. and July, and uh, yeah, and at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, it was just as hot as it is here and uh, when the sun goes down, mm -hmm. the humidity, you know. Yeah. So, finally we had to get another uh, uh, medical. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had to strip off, and then like in the First World War, you formed fours, there were four in each uh, row, you know, mm -hmm. all the way back. Well, in this second one, where you were in threes, and uh, the reason they had that, they called it for act act training, like one file would uh, lead, and then uh, on one side of the road, and then the second file would be mm -hmm. behind them on the upside of the road, and then the third file would be opposite again, behind the first file, only one, uh, while back. Well, uh, we had all of this stuff and we got paraded for uh, new uniforms and uh, pay uh, assignment, will assignment, uh, trades uh, uh, assignment, and battle dress and rifles and all of this stuff, uh, respirators mm -hmm. and uh, the whole new mess tins, everything. So, uh, one way, you had to pray in there naked, see, and there was three doctors in there, so the first three guys went, and the guy on the left, if I remember right, went first, he went to the third doctor, then the next guy to the second doctor, and I was on the other, outside file again, I was the last doctor, and this guy was a great big fella. Do you remember Bill Burns? That, yeah. Uh, Great big yeah. huge fella. Yeah. Well, this fella looked like him. He was a major, a doctor, and uh, so when we went in there naked, right? He says, "Well, he said, uh, how are you today?" And I always had a habit of saying first class, you know, like I always had anybody on the uh, mm -hmm. street ask me, I'd say first class. And he slapped me on the shoulder and he says, hi, he says, that's what I let you hear. He says, we never hear this very much. And I never thought anything, it was just the way I was woke. And so they started at the top of your head and they have your, uh, uh, they call it a, a 105. That's all your um, history and everything and your medical and everything else. Whether you were no good bum or what, you know, everything was there. So, uh, to start, I forget now whether it was at your ears or your eyes and so on. And every time they did one, they'd turn around, they'd go back, and they'd look at your records or your medical records from all the doctors from Nelson all the way. See, 
And uh, finally, he got down to my feet. And uh, I have hammer toes, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to clinch. And, uh, and uh, psoriasis, I was bothered with psoriasis. And he says, oh, he says, how long have you had this? And I told him the truth. I said, oh, about 15 years. And he goes and he marks on the bottom uh, right-hand corner across the corner, and I rejected. And I said, why? I said, what do you mean, rejected? Well, he said, we'll send you to specialists. He said, then, he said, we'll know, and then we'll let you know. So he said, put on your clothes, and I put on my clothes, and then I had to go out. And uh, I hung around there for better than 10 days, and what had happened, they had sent our file overseas with the whole bunch who we were ready to go overseas, see, and I went to England and had to come back before they could uh, give me my final medical, medical see. And I didn't know that then. See, I was, I had reached my 39th birthday, see. Right. And when I told them, you know, that I was first class, that's the kind that they watch out for, see. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was afraid nobody in the army ever wanted to go back to that. They always figured that the place they left was the worst place on earth, see. And uh, so uh, I didn't know, but. I shouldn't have even had to go and pick it to see unless you know more laboring doing all kinds of things and they sent us downtown and there's some beautiful big homes there in Stratford, Ontario, and this big home almost like Blaylocks, you know. Some doctor down there owned it, but I guess it's crooked stuff or something. They probably got a good pile for it. And we had to clean out all of this place and uh, one day morning I went out again. Uh, on picket, like I was supposed to do. And the sergeant came up and he said, what are you doing here? And uh, I said, uh, I beg your pardon? And he said, well, he said, aren't you uh, uh, rejected? And I said, yeah. Well, he said, you've got no business on picket duty. So he says, you're going over to the canteen or to the hut. He says, you, you don't have to work anymore. So I... Uh, I went to the canteen, and you know how crooked things are? When we were at Chilliwack and Vernon, and especially at Chilliwack, the, the syrup, like once in a while we got a couple of miserable little pancakes, you know, hot cakes, and the syrup was actually like water. And uh, uh, and everything was like that, see? And uh, when it got down there, here we had pure... Carol syrup. Mm -hmm. And uh, the real thing, see, oh, and there was good grub, and uh, you go down to the canteen, and there was good stuff there. So I went there, and I was always so thirsty, so I used to go and get tea. Coffee was always my drink, but it was so hot. And that there, uh, this was in London, Ontario. Uh, so I went and I'd get a cup of tea, and then I picked up. Um, Oh, we have that same magazine here now, the Geographic. Mm -hmm. And I opened it up, and the first thing I saw was Kokanee Park. Um, and I was reading this, and I was right home in it, you know. And the next thing I heard, my name piped huh? on there. And, uh, and they told me to repair, report to uh, the uh, uh, clinic. And uh, this is in Wolseley Barracks. Uh, it's the number one district people for Canada. Mm -hmm. That's where the railway corps mm -hmm. was assigned to that one. See, and uh, uh, I went, and I a couple of days there, I went to uh, mm -hmm. five doctors, and the last one was the one that rejected me at mm -hmm. Stratford, Ontario, mm -hmm. and uh, I got my medical, and you know. When you get it, and they don't say goodbye, go to hell, or anything, man. You're out on your own. And uh, I was right down the first time I was in the Army, I was right down to the 
night before, uh, I didn't have uh, any money for it to get a package of tobacco for the road cigarettes. And that was the first time, all the time, I was in the Army. And uh, so that, after I got through the medical and that, they paraded me downtown. They gave me $35 clothing allowance. And then they gave me, like, we bought victory bonds uh, uh, in the, while we were in the Army, and you got a discount on them. But, and they take off so much each page. Mm -hmm. But mine, I don't know, I had about uh, 40 or $50, I think, uh, uh, on that one. See, I had my other ones at home here. And uh, so, I all of a sudden, I got $85. And uh, I was in clover again, but uh, then I I hiked for home as fast as I could. And I met, do you remember, I don't suppose you would remember, people by the name of Vassars, they had uh, the Hot Springs Hotel at Ainsworth and all that. And the, and the father of this fella had the Vassars Meat Market and it was in the, like next to Woolworths in the old Madden mm -hmm. Hotel. Do you remember that name? No. Well, they had, uh, the, they ran the whole of Ainsworth, the, this Alabaster and his wife, mm -hmm. all during the Depression, and oh, they were wonderful people. And the old man, he had been the head accountant for P. Burns for all of the meat markets mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. And he had been a great athlete. And then he went back to Ontario and uh, uh, they went, uh, like when war broke out too, uh, they uh, left the, uh, their lease, I guess, ran out with Burns uh, for Ainsworth. And they went back and they bought three hotels in London, Ontario. One in the town and two uh, on the outskirts somewhere. And I was, uh, before I got my discharge, I was down on the main drag. Uh, one Saturday night, and uh, along comes this man and another man, and uh, I uh, I looked at him, and I went over and I tapped him on the shoulder, and he turned around and looked, you know, a guy in a monkey suit, you know, I guess he figured I was going to put him on the, yeah. uh, the beat on him. So I asked him, aren't you Mr. Vassar? And he said, yes. And he looked at me. I said, do you remember me? He said, yes. And, uh, I said, well, I said, uh, what are you doing down here? Well, he says, we, we have uh, three hotels here. And I said, well, where is Al? And, uh, well, he says, he's up at Savoy Hotel. And he says, well, he saw then that I wasn't uh, a bum, you know. And he said, well, he said, would you like to go out to the ball game? And uh, they have great baseball down there. And I don't know if that was the night that Babe Ruth and Walter Johnson and Ty, and Ty Cobb, uh, uh, Connie Mack, and John McGraw were the two coaches. Wow. They were playing benefit game, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there. Wow. And I, I didn't know that then, see. And uh, I said, no. Well, they said, uh, uh, well, why don't you go up to Al? I said, well, I said, I won't go up now, but I said, I'll, 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 I'd like to see him before I go home. And uh, so it was just a few days after that when I got my discharge. So when I went downtown, uh, I went and I found the Savoy Hotel. And uh, I got a room. And they didn't have a dining room or anything, and it reminded me of the Madden Hotel, much like it was, same size. And uh, uh, they made me come in their old family dining room and have my meals there with them. And I wanted to pay, and they wouldn't let me pay. And I said, no. I said, I want to pay. I said, you know, I said, I did work for you people at Ainsworth. And, that. and I said, and you paid me. I said, no, I want to patronize you. Nothing doing it. And uh, they wouldn't hear. So, uh, the old man used to be stationed in the early days in Castle, you know, and uh, when he was a great athlete, too, and that was when the slow can was made. 
And uh, of course, Al and his wife had the Ainsworth. So I, when I got home, I went down to Alan's art shop when Jimmy Allen was alive then, and I bought a beautiful colored uh, picture, uh, a little smaller than one of those framed ones, of Cas looking down from way up on the, you remember there used to be a great big bridge went up the hill to where the school is and the hospital? No, and I don't even know. Well, it's a highway up yeah. and now, but there was a huge big bridge. And I think that Jimmy Allen took that picture from there, and oh, it was a beautiful one of Caslow. So I sent it back to them with the letter, thanking them so much. And uh, I got another letter back from Mrs. Rasher. And she was saying how tickled the old man was that he hung that uh, picture up in the office, you know, of the hotel next to the desk. And all the people that went in there wanted to know where that beautiful place was. And they said the old man was just in heaven uh, 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 tell them all about the castle. Wow. So uh, when you were talking about the waterfront, you know, yeah. uh, this has been, uh, this thing has bothered me, and I wrote a lot of letters mm -hmm. with that thing. And the only one I think that made any mark was that last one about the West Tower. Did you read that one too? Mm -hmm. When I was saying that they shouldn't allow the, uh, uh, that they'd make them clean the whole thing up, they were going to buy it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went into Louis Magdalene in the city hall. Is this on? Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to more about that. Well, anyway, I want to hear it. He wants to hear it. Way up mm -hmm. behind the mountain station, mm -hmm. they called it Burns Meadows. Yeah. Well, Bill Green, this old Bill Green, you know, he was uh, uh, a big man. And he was uh, very prominent in Nelson in the early days. And do you know that when he died, I was told P. Burns left his widow a pension for as long as she lived a good pension. And uh, anyway, Bill Prino and uh, Bill Moraro, you know, Bill Moraro, mm -hmm. they were kids about my age. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went up there. And the smelter, the big stack was up there then, and the big roasters, you know, there were things bigger around almost than this house. And there were big flues underground then, and the kids got up in there and they found uh, a tin of blasting caps. And they took, and they started pounding them on, you know, one rock and pounding them with the other, and they blew their fingers off. They were lucky they didn't blow their eyes out or their brains out, you know, or kill themselves. And uh, I told them. Louis, I said, don't forget, you'll have all of that. And I said, another thing, too, uh, you leave those buildings down there, and the same thing will happen. They'll go on fire. And I said, Un underneath that, I said, the most of that stuff is bark and pitch and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And even if it is water soaked from that, when it gets down there and it gets fire, I said, you get your fire department down there. And I said, they could get trapped in there. And... Uh, so I told him, and I said, now you're talking about entry, industries. I said, Louie, I said, man, I said, with your ability and I said, your experience, I said, do you think for one minute that you can get any industry going along here? I said, what the hell would you do? Wheel it out in a wheelbarrow? Uh, because you got no trains. And uh, I said, uh, if you know what's good for you, you leave it alone. And I told him about when the fire broke out uh, up Sheep Creek at the Kootenay Bell Mine. This was in the uh, in the 1930s. Uh, there were burning slashings down at the Kootenay Bell Mine and about nearly more than a mile further up the road was the Gold Belt Mine. And there was four feet of solid snow on the ground. And a fire broke out down that thing there and it burned underneath the snow, all those uh, uh, slabs, see? Yeah. And, it's uh, hot. and it got a dandy draft, see? Yeah. And it, there was a gold belt mine powder house. Oh my it was God. a big building, was loaded with dynamite. 
And when they see this wire was gone and they didn't seem to be able to get it out, uh, they all ran for tunnels and down the road and there was one man, uh, he was either Austrian or, or Yugoslavian, not name was Johnny Crazier or some name like that. Uh, he was the only one. He had presence of mind and he stopped and he says to himself, he says, what the hell is the use of running? He says, uh, if this goes up, uh, everything uh, everywhere. Sure, everywhere. you'd be killed in the tunnels and everywhere, the confession. And uh, so he stayed. And my golly, it wasn't uh, Michael Dunham that was the superintendent of the mine, and he told me this story himself when I was working up there after that. This Johnny, he stayed, and it wasn't 10 feet from the powder house when he got him put out. He mm -hmm. shoveled snow and everything else, and I guess blocked it, uh, choked the flames. Yeah. And that fellow, like I told Louis, I said, you know, that fellow, he walked out of there, uh, a wealthy man, because every time there was a strike or anything in the mine where they, uh, mm -hmm. it was a gold mine, see, and any time there would be, they hit a, a rich vein or something, well, the stock market, you know, the stock would go up, they'd raise the price of their stock. And Johnny used to go into Gene Poulin's office. Gene had the stock board, see? Mm -hmm. And Mike O'Donnell used to be in there all the time, too, when he used to tell him. And Johnny went out of there, well, man, I told him, Louie, I said, you know, if that could happen down here, too, that if that ever gets in all that pitch and stuff, there's no way you could stop it. I told him, look, when Well, there's been a mill on that site forever, wasn't there? Oh. A mill there, an early one owned by American fellows. Well, there was a, uh, there, there was more, anyway. There was more than sixty years ago. Yeah. There was, because I used to uh, go with Teddy Grissel. We used to go up to Five Mile and, and Powder Point. Uh, you know that's up like Coolery. Mm -hmm. We used to go up in Teddy's canoe mm -hmm. and fish uh, like troll. And there was a mill on that. Sure. Side for and then there was a fellow by the name of uh, Johnson. Uh, that ran at the small men. That and then there was, I think. I'm was trying to remember, page? was it Russell Tellus? There was a mill at the. They were American money. And it was well, the ferry people, I think. Oh. That had a, a, a mill on that. Yeah. Senator's well, Lumber Company, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Well, you know, there was um, uh, there was quite a few exports mm -hmm. out here, mm -hmm. right across. Canada, the United States oh, now, yeah. like the, there was the Lindsay brothers that had the poles mm -hmm. and pilings and fence posts, and they had theirs up um, uh, Meadow Creek, you know, that's mm -hmm. out by Park Siding. They had four camps up there. Oh, not the Meadow Creek, up in Lardo. No, but I mean, uh, and then there was, a, uh, I think the Bell Telephone, the uh, Bell Pole Company used to have a pole yard out there on that site, too. Uh, were uh, KFP. KFP in oh. and then it was Lake Glacier Lumber right. Company. Oh, yeah. Before, yeah. yeah. And uh, there was other, and then there used to be a block fat, uh, a box factory just uh, between the park and uh, Walton's Boat Houses. You remember right. where they were? Yeah. And, and there was, there used to be iron boxes and stuff. Huh? And the ironworks. Oh, and the ironworks was, was uh, uh, right, uh, uh, you know, a central truck was there after. Yeah. Uh, uh, right, uh, well, where the ironworks was, that's the park, uh, parking well, spot for the... For the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, what was on, right on the waterfront, Walt's Boat Works, and then there was another place, but Metallurgical Works, or... Oh, so well, by the park, yeah. by the park, by the bridge, that piece of cement that looked like the a big loaf of bread, I think that's gone now, by the... No, it's there. Is it still there? Yeah, the sink. Well, that, that was the pilot uh, plant. There was a man by the name of uh, French, mm -hmm. an old, um, I don't know whether it was a, a geologist or a mining engineer, mm -hmm. but he, he was the one that uh, uh, discovered and uh, worked on that and got what they call the French process. Mm -hmm. And it was the one, that's how they... Uh, were able to treat the Sullivan Mine or Kimberley. Mm -hmm. You know, before that, the first people that had it 
was the, I think probably the biggest mining outfit on the American continent called the Guggenheimers. You may have heard of them. The Guggenheimers were big, big, big outfit. They took it and they built a smelter at Marysville. You know, Marysville is somewhere near Cranbrook. Yeah. Yeah. This lag was up there. It's gone now, I think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this French Patnon, the mm -hmm. jeweler, yeah. he backed him with a lot of money and he had a big interest in that. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we were going to school, St. Joseph School, uh, he made, Pat not made, I think, at least a half a dozen trips to London, England, to the Privy Council to fight Kamenko. It was called CMS, Consolidated Mind and Smelling. And uh, he, um, he went all those times and, uh, and then we were told that he was offered a million dollars to settle it out of court. Mm -hmm. And now, I honestly don't know whether Pat Nod, uh did, like he may have outlived uh, French or he may have even bought his interest out, I don't know. And I don't know whether Pat Nod got a million dollars or not, but I do know that Pat Nod was a wealthy man <coughs> and he left it all here. And he told me one time that he, uh, you know, he had the, uh, uh, you know, where he had his jewelry oh, store. Yeah, really. it. Well, at the back, there was um, a building that had been an assay office, mm -hmm. you know, and. Uh, had a big uh, safe. Pardon? It probably had a big safe. An yeah. assay office would have a really big safe in. Big safe in the assay office? Well, the, the, it's it's gone. No, I tell you where the big safe was was uh, in that building that used to be uh, uh, Oliver's newsstand, the old frame building. In the early days, it was the Bank of British Columbia, yeah. and also there was the Bank of Commerce by it, mm -hmm. and in that big. Uh, thing that was evolved there, and uh, Jelinas had that uh, long before my memory starts. Uh, there was a Scotty McDonald or a McDonnell, and uh, uh, Archie McDougall, they were brother in laws. They uh, started the cigar store and that, and they called it the Semaphore, and all the railroaders used to go there, and that's mm -hmm. why they called it the Semaphore. And uh, uh, then uh, when Jelinas built his building in 1922, uh, uh, you know where he was, yeah. uh, there next to the medical arts, yeah. uh, Hipperson, uh, Mr. Hipperson used to uh, be with the Nelson Hardware Company, right. they were wholesale and yeah. retail hardware yeah. store, and he quit that and he went and he started his own hardware store in there, where Oliver's bookstore was. Mm -hmm. And he had two partners. One was uh, uh, Mr. Art Williams. He was um, he had the franchise for Ingersoll Rand, mm -hmm. the mining mm -hmm. compressors and all the mining machinery. He had the, the franchise all the way from Thunder Bay, Ontario, up to the Yukon, and he had his office in. Where that uh, in the McCullough block, you know, where Simpson Sears are, mm -hmm. and the little store that that people wings are in. Mm -hmm. Well, he had that. That was his office. He had his uh, stuff in there in the basement. That and he was one partner, and uh, a man that had been a tailor here in the early days was the other partner. His name was Vincent, and those three formed the Hardware, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, Williams was a silent partner, and uh, what's his name, uh, Vincent, uh, he, he was the bookkeeper in that, and uh, Mr. Hipperson was the uh, uh, store manager, uh, the store manager yeah. 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 And, uh, and he was a good one too. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, they had that, and that's, uh, 
that's where uh, where that fault that you're talking about. And I heard when you were talking about Blake, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that that vault was used for that uh, uh, during the <laughs> prohibition. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but uh, that Mr. Williams, he uh, he might have. Or maybe they were gone for him. There was Margaret Williams and Jackie Williams, and they lived on uh, Seneca Street. And uh, do you know where Gary's lived, the architect? No. Well, the, the Methodist Church, mm -hmm. and straight across the street on the odd side, and uh, odd numbers, was um, Gary's home. Mm -hmm. He was an architect. And the house above it was William's house, and Mrs. Uh, uh, Charlie Hafty lived Let's there now. now. Yeah, that's the house uh -huh. where Williams lived there. Do you there. remember, or did, you, did your parents know that the Cap go to the Catholic Church on Josephine Street? Sure, my father's aunt was buried from there, the one that I was telling you yeah, about. Was that house. where that white square house is now? Well, that where the church used to uh, be? I think it was the little one on the corner. Ah. Uh, and uh, I think they had that other one too, and the, the big one I think could have been uh, that Father Furland's uh, rectory. rectory ah, that, I see. Because it was big white steps. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the first first nuns to Nelson uh, uh, stayed in my uh, father's uncle Nance's yeah. house there. Uh, uh, some people by the name of Stack live there now. It's the uh, you know where the brewery is? Well, mm -hmm. the first house uh, from the Ward Street side, and there's a stone wall around it, and that uh, in the front yard, and the brewery office was next to it. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, it's right behind Brazel's mm -hmm. greenhouses. Mm -hmm. That's the house that they were. Uh, they both died in that house. Mm -hmm. Okay. I interrupted you when you were saying something about Byron. I interrupted you when you were saying something about Mr. Patnod in the back of the store. Oh yeah, um, Patnod. He uh, he wanted uh, uh, me to take that uh, back place that had been an assay office, and he said, Julius, he said, uh, I'll uh, let you have it. Uh, you know, very reasonable. And I said, Well, no. I said, Mr. Patnod, I couldn't have it, and I'll tell you. You know, if I had brought that thing, see, uh, I would have had to hire somebody to, to be stay. there and to yeah. home. Yeah. And one man can't make the living for two or three. And if no. I'd have got a helper, then the last guy that would ever get a nickel to you. live on would be me. <laughs> see, yeah. and I knew that. And I'll tell you who taught me that. Uh, when I. Uh, uh, went to work a trail in uh, the uh, in December 1929 when the stock I was at Cranbrook working for a plumber in Cranbrook when the stock oh, crashed yeah. and uh, I was supposed to be there steady you see and the stock crash come and it got bitter cold and that and everything kind of shut down tight and this old plumber he had one young fella from Quebec, his name was Tommy Gonyan. He kept him, which was only fair. See? And then he, laid, he laid, laid me off, and I had got, he, he had asked me if I knew of a, a, a man, a steam fitter, one that could work on uh, denim heating systems. And I said, yes. I said, uh, this one in Nelson that I used to work under him. Well, he said, would you uh, see if you could get him? So I went and I wired for him, and he came up. So he laid the two of us off, uh, and uh, we come back, and when we were coming back, when we got to Moye, they were just moving, the families were moving out of there on the same train that we were still, the boat was still running on the lake, see, and uh, that was 29. Yeah. And uh, some of my guests went to Warfield uh, to work on the building of the fertilizer plant in different places, but all those families broke up their homes and were leaving. So I went... I was home uh, just about a week, and uh, I got a call from Mr. Balfour at Trail, and I went to work on the Conquest Hotel. So, uh, 
I stayed at the Arlington Hotel, and Mr. Pete Lebeck, you've heard of that name, well, he ran the Arlington Hotel, and uh, when they were building this Crown Point, it was then the nicest hotel in the Kootenai State, and uh, I stayed at the Arlington, and there was two fellas, their name was Hans, there were two brothers from Drunk Heller. They were building this hotel, and they wanted Pete Lebeck to go and manage it. And uh, I said to him, like he used to sit and come and talk to me, you know, and that, and I said, well, Mr. Lebeck, I says, why wouldn't you take that? I said, that nice big hotel? And so, he used to smoke cigars, you know, and he had some fingers off, and he could manage that cigar, you know, twisting around, and I used to be fascinated watching that. So he pointed out to me something that I learned, and I didn't forget it either. He said, now, he said, look, he said, if I took that, I have to have the minimum of people that I could employ here. I'd have to have about, I forget now whether it says four or six in the beer parlor. Because you do long shifts, see. And then there'd have to be so many for chambermaids. Mm -hmm. There'd have to be uh, so many. For the night uh, yeah. Pardon? The desk. The desk. The dining place. room. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and then all of the other stuff, mm -hmm. the rent and everything. And he says, if I all paid them less than what they should be getting, he says, and when I got finished, then, he says, there wouldn't be anything out of nickel for me to live on. And so... When Pat and I wanted to give me this, I remembered that. See, and I had only started, when I started for myself, I only had a few tools. And I was the last plumber to work on the medical arts. See, when I, I worked on that uh, Crown Point Hotel for Balfour, and then I worked on the Duke of Wars, uh, Les Ross, Riverside Apartments, and on uh, uh, the end of uh, Bay Avenue and Trail, you know, and when the Big flood was on there, half of it went into the river. Mm -hmm. And then I, I came over here and I worked on the medical arts for him. And uh, I was the last plumber to work on the medical arts. And then uh, I was going to, uh, and my father said to me, he said, well, he said, Julie, she says, why don't you start for yourself? And I thought, hey, start for myself and the depression on and there's, and three plumbing shops there, and they were all old timers, and had and, all the people. And I thought, well, and I only had just a few little miserable little tools in the gunny sack seat. And uh, so he said, you know, he said, Julia, she said, what do you want to be aroused about for? He says, and go from pillar to post. He says, work a couple of months here, and then go there and work a couple of months. He says. Why don't you be your own boss? He says, even if you only make two bits a day for a while till you get started, he says, it's wonderful to be your own boss. So I thought, and I didn't have any money then, and he said, well, so you said, uh, how much is the license? So the plumbers had raised years before, had raised the price to $25 a year, pay it all on by the 15th of January, see, and all the other outfits like uh, the Wood Bells and uh, Hudson Bay and them paid ten dollars a year, uh, five dollars uh, on the 15th of January and, and five dollars on the 15th of July. But the plumbers went to the city and got them to do that so that the plumbers from outside wouldn't come in and they'd have to pay. $25 for a license. Well, that would be enough to stop them because then they'd have to pay the room and board and they wouldn't get anything for a house. So, and there wasn't that much building here, so the plumbers were smart. So, <laughs> I started and, you know, I went down and applied for my license and uh, old Watson was the city clerk then. My father gave him the $25 a check and I took it down and uh, you have to uh, put an application in for an examination, see, mm -hmm. to see if you qualify. They kept me waiting. I think it was 
in March that I took that check there. And I went down there in June. <laughs> oh, and they hadn't sent me a chance, and I went after Watson. Boy, I gave him a talking to. Uh, even if I was uh, yeah, he thought a kid, you know. And that made it hard for me because they all looked on me as a Nelson kid, you know. And uh, so I told him, I said, now look, I said, uh, I come here, I says, with honest intentions. And I says, I asked for an examination. And I said, I gave you the check for $25. And I said, uh, you've got the $25. And I said, now, I said, I try to be decent and work within the law. So now I said, you can go to hell. I said, I'm going to work anyway. I said, you are not, you have no right to deprive me from Pardon. making a living. So by golly, uh, decoration day comes. And uh, it was a Saturday. And you know, uh, decoration day in the United States is a big holiday, like our 24th of yeah. May, you see. So, uh, a lot of the Americans were coming up here because it was still prohibition there, and they used to come up here in droves, you know. So, I guess they told me to come down on Saturday night to the city hall at 7 o'clock, and I guess they figured, you know, that while a kid really didn't want to go where the action is. So I went down, and there was Mr. Affleck, the city engineer, and there was Dr. Arthur, who was the medical health mm -hmm. officer for the city. The city used to have their own medical yeah, health yeah. officer. Yeah. And he was a real man, a man's man, that fellow. And, uh, and he had always been on every uh, examining board from the time the city was incorporated. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, she, for sanitary reasons. So there was only the two of them there, and Mr. Affleck was the chairman of the city engineer, and he had two big foolscap pages, the big long ones, you know, with the thin lines, mm -hmm. and he asked me all of these questions, and I, I drew a few uh, rough sketches of mm -hmm. painting and so on, mm -hmm. and so when I finished, he said uh, to Dr. Arthur, he said, uh, Boyd, that was his name, Boyd Affleck, he said, Boyd, he says, why is it that, he said, you've asked this young fellow all of these questions, but he said, you never asked any of the others, and he had been, mm -hmm. well, he says, true. yes, but he says, from now on, he says, we're going to. So, that was fine, he, so, uh, Big Graves was the examining plumber, and they had to be examining plumber. And the funny part of it was that Big Graves learned his, this is the old Big Graves, mm -hmm. he had learned his trade in the same place as I did only 12 years before, see, when he started. And he never, and then he worked for the BC Plumbing those 12 years plus uh, six more, 18 years altogether, and then he quit and he started his own business. But, so then I had to go down <laughs> again, they called me again, and I had to go down on a, I forget now, a Wednesday or a Thursday afternoon at 2.30, I think it was. So, uh, Boyd Affleck wasn't there this time. He had to be out uh, of town somewhere, and uh, uh, Frank Stringer, the old man Stringer, was a plumbing inspector, and he was there, and Dr. Arthur was there again, and uh, at Graves. So oh, I had to wipe a joint, that's with solder, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the art of plumbing. That's mm -hmm. a lost art now, they don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, so he gave me the pot of solder, the fire pot, you know, and uh, I had to prepare this joint, shave the lead, and, mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, uh, fix it up and start the fire pot and get the solder ready and I stir the solder up and down like this. Uh, I wiped the joint, but I had quite a bit of trouble with it and uh, uh, it wasn't smooth, see, and, and neat looking. And 
big bridge come over to it, and he could be very sarcastic too, you know. And uh, he uh, he had a habit of walking in with his hands in his pocket, and he used to spin on one heel, mm -hmm. you know, this way and that way. And uh, he said, "Well, he said, gentlemen, he said, what's your verdict?" Strainer came over and he looked at the joint. Well, he said, now, Nick, he says, that wasn't very good solder you did. <laughs> no, and that's as true as I stand yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, we're here, I should say. And Vic hummed it hard a bit. And so Dr. Arthur went over and he looked at it. And he says, well, he says, I'll tell you something to Vic Briggs. He says, I paid for a lot of joints. He said, that weren't any better than that one because he had property around, you know. And I always admired uh, Dr. Arthur. Yeah. He didn't know me before that, but uh, he was fair, yeah. and and so was uh, Stringer. Yeah. And Stringer was uh, the uh, uh, yeah. he ran the gas works, you know, yeah. Yeah. and he had been a plumber. Yeah. And uh, but I went uh, I uh, run the gauntlet all right, getting my license. Mm -hmm. And Big Riggs had never been, had an examination. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but when I answered all these questions, I think it was a little bit afraid too. Because mm -hmm. I'll tell you, when I was working, now, I shouldn't be prone and blagging, is that anything on? Mm -hmm. I think everybody's dead and gone. Okay. Oh, well, anyway, I'm not telling anymore about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I had the time, though. Yeah. Yeah. It was a closed shop in lots of ways. Pardon? It was a closed shop in lots it of was, ways. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, and it's getting to be the same thing, and they're going to make it worse uh, with this waterfront. This is why I've thought about the waterfront all the way along. You know, if they build a hotel down on there, and uh, then you'll find out that it'll never be a go. It'll be just riffraff down there. There'll be bootleggers and everything else down there, you know, and it'll never be any good. But there is a place in Nelson that could make a hotel that would make money for Nelson. It would, uh, it could support a payroll of 25 people. And I'll tell you where that spot is, where the Kootenai Lake General Hospital used to be. Mm -hmm. If it was built similar to that shape and built five or six stories high because it wouldn't interfere anything the bluff was behind it and if you remember the hospital mm -hmm. would have that nice shape and uh, skirted around like the bluff and they had those fire escapes out onto the bluff and they could make nice little paths there see from those fire escapes mm -hmm. and that where people could walk they could have uh, down where all the lawn and that is they could have uh, all the parking they want down there, they could have a couple of carriages of it. And they could drive in from Edgewood Avenue and go through and, and come out by the where the old nurse's home was. Mm -hmm. And on the top floor, they could have, like they used to have at the Hume Hotel, they could have uh, 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 for uh, resident people now, like, because lots of uh, people live in these high-rise places in Vancouver and those places that that probably pay more than a thousand dollars a month uh, for their room work. They could do the same thing here. They could have uh, 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 a whole floor, maybe or more, of those steady ones. They could have the other rumors there. They could have a nice dining room. They could have a coffee shop. They could even have a place in there for uh, hairdressers, like they could be in that sleep up there, you know, that could live with dignity, you know, and could pay for it. Then some of these people that have lots of money in that, they uh, they may not be uh, as old as me, and they might, uh, if they have money, they might like to go and buy uh, maybe a little bookstore or a peanut stand or, or a little dress shop or something. They could get money into town. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you now, like, they built Sandman Inn out there. Just imagine if they built that thing here with that beautiful lay, uh, view of the lake 
and all that fresh air and that, and we don't have no folk of smoke like mm -hmm. Sandman in this and the smoke from the trail smelter. We got it made here if they only knew it. And like I wanted uh, uh, a big community center, you know, like if they took and uh, they could have, like I mentioned, the snowball frolics and that. Supposing that all of the hospitals and all of that up there all gathered and have one here. Just imagine the amount of money that comes to that's like that snowball frolic in the Depression time used to bring a lot of money for the taxis and for the uh, hotel rooms. And for, uh, was that like the snow fest is now? Oh, that was a, it was just a one night, a big invitational ball. Mm -hmm. And boy, the, the girls, even at West Depression, mm -hmm. they used to go and they buy their nice dress or something, and they used to say, well, I wonder what Mrs. Rich Fitch is going to be wearing. <laughs> and you know, it was competition. <laughs> why did they knock down the old? Pardon? Why did they knock down the old hospital? They were stupid, you know. Uh, That's what I thought. But I thought absolutely. it must be. You know, they sold that. Uh, the government got that, and they sold that to Bishop Doyle, and they started uh, community or uh, what they call Columbia College. Yeah. And it didn't go, and they let it go to rack and ruin there. And they should have never sold, the government should have never sold that. That should have been um, uh, one of those uh, homes for, uh, like, uh, Kiwanis Villa, you know, up there on Rosemont where they room and board and that. They could have had the same thing there. And it could have been for, like, there's always, you have to wait. You, you could be uh, buried before you get a chance to get to Mount St. Francis or Willow Haven, you know. Uh, they should, that, should, that was a waste. But can you see, can you see the value of that uh, hotel? You know, when Billy and I uh, went down to Fredericks in uh, New Brunswick uh, after our son Tommy died, we had to go down and get all his stuff, you know, and his books and everything, and... Uh, uh, we stopped in motels all along the way, and then Ottawa was the worst one of all that we ever saw, and we paid the most for it. We paid sixty-eight dollars in tax for a room that wasn't any bigger than this, and there was a lousy little bit of a clothes closet and and a little washroom, and the door you step right onto the street, and it was noisy. We paid sixty-eight dollars for one night plus the tax, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the best ones that best, very best one we were in uh, was one uh, in Fredericton. It, it's called the um, Sequoia Inn, and it's a motor hotel, and they have their dining room and everything right down there, and it's uh, right across. Well. Uh, it's, it's not any more than uh, 300 feet uh, to the CBC building. Mm -hmm. And then another, it wouldn't be 600 feet from the hotel uh, to the uh, Alice, or no, Dr. Chalmers Memorial mm -hmm. Hospital. That's the hospital that Tommy was in at first, and then he had to be moved to uh, St. Bro uh, St. John of Brunswick. But uh, that hotel, hotel, was the best one, and then we had a room there. We were down there uh, five, it was six years in September. Billy and I went down to visit Tommy when he was going to uh, the University of New Brunswick. That's the oldest university in Canada. We took he took us and showed us places down there at that time. We were in those buildings. Some of those buildings on that campus are over 200 years old. Big buildings, and we went through a cemetery that was right in the heart of the town. Uh, that uh, was in the 1700s when the uh, Empire Loyalists landed there. I think we should quit. Yeah. It's 11. Well, no. you never we'll know that you've got to a windbag. <laughs> no, it's great. That's great. But I think we should come back again well, another yeah. time. I tell you, and I, I, got, you know, another thing. Talk about other things. What I tell you, what I would like to do, I would like to uh, talk quite a bit about the waterfront yeah. and describe 
uh, all the what things, I had. You yeah. know, like I had in it that, uh, that we could make a, an independent, permanent payroll. Mm -hmm. We could, if we had that, um, uh, Billy and I was talking about it the same way with the library. And I wanted like a great big stone fireplace in each one. And they could have those buildings, they could have a, a, a gallery, and they could take, and you can get thousands of different pictures like this of the Coopies, the Slow Can, the Lardo. That one there, my sister in law painted that one from a snapshot. Uh, that, I forget now whether that's Kokanee Lake or Castle Lake. Uh, Billy took the, the little uh, snapshot and he gave Marjorie, she's a retired nurse now, they live in Clearbrook, and uh, she painted a bunch of them and uh, she sold some of them for for over $300 and so they have uh, art displays down there. She painted that one for Billy and she was only starting to paint them. She only started on her own that for something to do after she yeah. quit nursing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>